I was driving and my brother was in the passenger seat reading the assigned chapter for that week's EMS class out loud. We were coming up on an exit when I saw the thing coming down the eastbound freeway ramp. I have to call it a thing because I have no idea what I saw. It moved so fast. To give an idea how fast, we were about 50 yards away and I saw it at the same time I heard it zip by. It looked like a ripple, like if you saw a heat distortion but throttling forward. It registered as a momentary blur. I don't have a reference for what I saw, so my brain instantly tried to reject it. It happened so fast, I didn't even react. Not so much as a what the fuck. I didn't even mention it. I will say this though. Traffic was heavy enough that it seems unlikely no one else saw, and I'm baffled that I, it could manoeuvre at that speed without colliding with other vehicles. I didn't think about it again until the next time we passed that exit, but even then, I thought about it for maybe a second. When we passed the exit again about a week later, my brother blindsided me. He said, bro, we have to talk about the blur. Apparently, he looked up from his book and saw the same thing I did but his take was a bit different. He claimed he'd been trying to talk to me about it all week, but every time he tried, his whole train of thought derailed. His take definitely gave me the creeps though. He believed that whatever he saw was actively trying to make us forget about it. He also said that he'd practiced saying the phrase, we have to talk about the blur, several times that day, just to make sure we talked about it. My best guess is that we saw an alien vehicle. I wish I had more to say on this, but that's all I have. If this has ever happened to you, I'd love to hear about it. This happened not too long ago, but I'm writing from how I remember the encounter. I'm 28, female, and always have some type of paranormal thing show up once a week, every three weeks, and so on. As I write this, I'm in Queens, but I live in the Bronx, visiting family. Anyway, I was sleeping in my bed. Just to give you an idea, my room in the Bronx is a small to medium-sized place. My room is small, but manageable enough to switch it up. My bed is near the window. The bookshelf is near the wall, next to the closet and door into the hallway leading to the kitchen. I have a dresser near my bed and a bigger dress. I only mentioned that because sometimes that is also where I see odd things. Anyway, it has to be around three or four o'clock in the morning when I felt something going like a crab moving on top of me in my bed. I wake the heck up thinking it's a family member or the cat, but neither. All I see is a dark shadow of something like a male figure, but a shadow near the bottom moving from side to side of the bed. I wanted to move, but I felt like I couldn't for whatever reason so I just kept my eyes directly at it. It was using its arms, like a crab walking on my bed. This happened for a few minutes before I finally woke up from not being able to move, and my half awake, half asleep self. I looked around and went back to sleep. Anyone wondering what that was? I got my guesses. Once it was completely materialized, meaning it was using a lot of energy. Two, I could not move, which I beat was it on a fucking purpose to put me in a damn neutral state, but the arms and body, that does raise questions. I have other experiences, sometimes around the bookshelf where I hear books or small items move, sometimes by my dresses, where things get knocked into or I hear tapping. The hall is basically near the bathroom, where in that experience I heard something in the bathroom. I know because when I'm in the dark, it happens one way or another, but you be the judge of that. Lately, I've been seeing things and I didn't think anything of it, until tonight. I constantly hear things moving, things that shouldn't be moving, in my home. I hear walking. Other stuff like that. Today, as I was getting ready to leave for school, I saw a strange man in the mirror for a split second before he disappeared. I was kind of shocked, but I forgot about it. 
I go through my day and it's time to go to sleep. It's normally really hard for me to fall asleep and tonight was no different. I tried to fall asleep and started having some weird dreams, nightmares. I woke up and thought nothing of it. Then I tried to go back to sleep. I had another strange nightmare and this time that same man I saw in the mirror earlier in the day was there. Needless to say, I was more shaken and frightened. I awoke and ran to the restroom to try and calm myself down. Then I tried to go back to sleep. Now this is the part that's making me write this post. When I was younger, say in middle school, I used to get sleep paralysis almost every night. And seeing things has never been a part of my sleep paralysis until tonight. I had another nightmare and realized I was half awake and paralyzed. Something that hadn't happened in years. But this was different. I was seeing things. That man. All I could do was whimper because I simply couldn't move. I was in shock and then something else strange happened. I felt something enter my body. Some kind of energy. I don't know how to explain it. My whole body shivered as I felt this and was having this vision. It was like nothing I've ever felt before. I got extremely cold and even more frightened. I finally got out of the paralyzed state and tried to make sense of things, but I simply couldn't. I'm just really in shock and don't know what to do. So I came here. I just want to know if anyone has ever experienced anything similar and how they dealt with it. I'll be telling these stories like if I would have to write it in a diary. It all started in summer 2010, when I was five, and my family moved to a rather big city in Switzerland. We live in a block building which was built in 2007, so it was fairly new at the time. Ever since I moved into there, I've been experiencing a lot of activity in my home, which is strange as it was just constructed. 2011 to 2014. Every now and then, me and my brother were seeing orbs floating around the transparent people staring at us. I was able to take a picture, which I am unable to upload, as the file is on a seven-year-old hard drive, which I accidentally dropped. But I'll try to explain it. It was a pic of a doorway in my home. The door was open, and in the doorway there was someone. A completely white person. No face, no eyes, nothing. Just a white flash in the shape of a person. Keep in mind that I didn't use the flash function for the picture. And there was a second picture even more scary. I was seven and really bored. My grandma just picked me up from school in her blue Mazda 3. I, for no reason, took out my 20 francs, $24 MP3 player, which has a shitty camera, and made a photo of the huge underground garage we were in. There was it. A round, seven foot tall, completely black person. Again, with no face or anything else except eyes. I was standing right in front of my grandma and staring down at her. 2015 to 2018. My brother and I were seeing a lot of ghosts in the reflection of our windows, especially when studying. But in this time period, nothing more happened. Activities became so rare that I thought the ghosts were gone. 2020 to now. I've been hearing a lot of strange sounds coming from my room. Something even growled at me while I was playing Minecraft single player. I didn't have my headphones on as I was trying to listen to my brother who just got called by a call center scammer. Then, right behind me, a growl like a werewolf. It's still one of the loudest sounds I ever heard, but I was the only one who heard this. The day before yesterday, 1.15am. As I'm 15 years old, I live with my parents, just like any other 15 year old. So that night, I had to take a massive dump. There is a hallway connecting the kitchen and the bathroom. So I just finished taking a dump and washing my hands. My brother, 16 year old, comes bursting into the bathroom and locks the door. He said he heard a door opening and locked us in so we don't get grounded for staying up so long. But it wasn't my mom. Not my grandparents who live with us. It was something unexplainable. 
So 20 minutes have passed and we're still locked in. I can hear rustling like someone was searching my jackets hanging in the same hallway as the bathroom. 30 minutes have passed. I hear footsteps and are freaked out. 34 minutes later, my brother just unlocked the door and we're making a run for it. Since then, every night, I hear footsteps coming from the same room. I need an explanation of what's going on in here as I can't get any sleep from hearing footsteps in the hallway and kitchen. I grew up on a farm that was settled by my great-grandfather in the 1800s. To this day, whenever I go back, I and anyone with me feel like we're being watched and that we're not welcome. My childhood was filled with terrifying interactions with the paranormal. My closet door would fly open in the middle of the night. My siblings and I would hear banging and voices all night and would discuss what we heard in the mornings. On a weekly basis, I would hear this cackling, growling sound getting closer and closer to my bed, eventually hearing it right beside me, and then feeling something push me into my bed and tell me it was going to drag me to the pits of hell. I would assume this was sleep paralysis, except for some noticeable things that happened afterwards. One evening after the threats, I went to my sister's room as my mother was sleeping in her bed because she was scared. I walk into her room and a floating head was on her bedpost, turning in circles, making the cackling sound. I went back to my room for a sleepless night. A few nights later, I heard the cackling again, getting closer and closer. I pulled the covers over my head and waited for the inevitable. My sister then screams at the top of her lungs, sending us all running to her room. She had heard the cackling and a ghost of a woman flew into her room, right above her bed terrifying. I won't get into details unless asked, but we messed around with a Ouija board my parents bought us for some reason, including once when we snuck it into a church, which was the craziest thing I've ever seen. It was like adding fuel to fire. Eventually, things quieted down after they got someone in, unsure who, and they determined there was a portal to hell in the closet and put some crystals around the house. The house to this day still has that eerie feeling of being watched and the feeling of not being wanted. I've been periodically stalked by entities since, but that's ended since I became a Christian. I don't do drugs or drink, FYI. This is not my first experience with things that have eye shine other than animals. This is not my first time seeing a shadow person. However, this is my first time seeing two shadow people at the same time and with eye shine. Through my new lizard tank I just bought yesterday. Needless to say, I flipped out and ran to get my parents and brother to come see them. And when I came back, they were gone. I was not thinking well at the moment to take a pic or video of it. Damn it. But I have this story to share, and I hope someone will at least see this and tell me what the fuck I saw. I just got this new common lizard I saved at work. He or she is blind in both eyes and was very dehydrated and hungry. It wouldn't get off my finger the whole day, so my bro and I decided to get it a tank and keep him. Well, I put this tank together real late last night and went to bed. I woke up late for work, but I decided to go ahead and feed and water and check on the little guy. I put my face almost up against the glass to watch him, when on the back of the tank I saw what looked like a shadow moving on the other side of the glass. I ignored it and didn't think anything of it until I saw a quick flash. I tracked it with my eyes and saw it flash a few times, then it came into focus. I thought I was seeing a cat's reflection on the window that was behind me, but then I could make out a general face shape of what I imagined was a person's face but it was all smoky shadow. Right where a human's eyes would be were two perfect eye shine globes. I could tell when it actually looked at me and saw me. It snapped its eyes on me and quickly disappeared from the back glass pane on the tank. That's when the second shadow figure appeared with its eye shine very bright and clear, almost like it had just walked up. And when it saw me, it started moving its head very, 
very, very fast, back and forth. I couldn't help it, but I started following its eye shine with my eyes when it started moving very fast back and forth. When it had my attention, it literally snapped its eyes onto mine, and I could not look away. It didn't flinch or move at all. That's when I freaked out and ran for my family to see if they could see this too. When I got there, the shadows were gone along with their eye shine. To me, it almost felt like I was the creature in a tank being watched. Freaky feeling. It's been bothering me all day, and any time I see a reflection anywhere, I'm always looking just in case I can see those things again. Whenever my grandfather would come to my house, I was 11 at the time, he would wash our dishes simply because he liked to. It gave him something to do. The funny thing about this was that he was not good at washing the dishes. They would always have a soapy taste and residue on them after he was done. We knew he liked to do it, so we never stopped him, just kind of dealt with it. Moving forward to the night he died, he passed at 6.20pm. The next morning, at exactly 6.20am, the dishes crashed. He had not been over our house for quite a few months, since he was hospitalised for a while before his passing. My family all went downstairs and just brushed it off as a coincidence and went back to bed. I woke up around 9am, freezing cold. I still had the events from 6am on my mind. I went downstairs and stood right at the sink and just stared at the dishes. All of a sudden... I felt a rush of warmth starting at my toes and eventually making its way up to my head. I knew he was there with me. I could just feel it. I started to make breakfast, pouring cereal and milk into a bowl. I couldn't believe it. My cereal tastes soapy. It had to be a sign from him, as he hadn't washed our dishes in months. I know that this isn't something entirely too active, but it's stuck with me to this day. I think about it so often, so I figured it was worth sharing. I live in a small town, right on the edge of a very popular wooded area that attracts a number of paranormal investigators every year. There's been multiple stories of the weird things that go on in those woods. Black-eyed girl, pigman, cult activity, weird cemeteries, alien sightings, etc, etc. Most of the locals have witnessed something weird go on in those woods, which has widely been reported. But first, I wanted to talk about a few experiences I've had from living in the town. I'll start with the experiences from my parents' house. So, this town is an ex miners community. Most of the town is now built on top of the old mines, including my parents' house. My parents' house is, in my opinion, 100% haunted. There's certain parts of the house I won't go into on my own. So, let's start from the beginning. We moved into this house back in 1999. Little things would happen, like things would go missing and turn up in weird places, but nothing major. Things started to pick up over time. One night, my dad, who used to believe there was no such thing as ghosts, was up late doing paperwork. He heard footsteps on the stairs and thought it was my mom coming down. After they reached the hallway, they stopped. He thought this was a bit odd and was about to get up to see what was going on. That was when his glass of wine slid across the entire dining room table and smashed up against the wall. Another experience my dad had was when he fell asleep on the sofa and said he was thrown across the room and he heard a man's voice tell him to go to bed. Personal experience that I've had in that house include seeing an apparition of some old style boots walk behind me in the mirror, footsteps and voices heard in the hallway and dining room at night. The whole family has seen things move across tables and the fireplace. The thing that creeped me out the most is that we've all seen the face of a man appear on the living room window. The front of my parents' house has a very long driveway, so we know it's not just someone walking past. We've all seen it, including visitors to our house and everyone has described it in the same way. The one experience that sticks with me the most 
is the time I was washing the dishes in the kitchen. It was pitch black outside, but all the kitchen lights were on, and you could see into the hallway. I saw the reflection of what I thought was my dad walking past behind me. I even felt someone walk past behind me. He carried on walking into the next room, which is a downstairs toilet. I started talking to him and thought it was a bit rude he didn't answer me. I then walked into the living room to find my dad sitting there. I asked him why he didn't answer me and his response was he hadn't moved from the living room all night. But I know I saw a man walk past me. The room that creeps everyone out. The dining room. This room is an extension onto the house and there's an archway connecting to the next room. There's something about this room and that archway that unsettles everyone. This is where a lot of the apparition activity has been spotted, including shadows, footsteps, and just a general unsettling feeling. I've also experienced someone tapping on the window from the outside of the dining room while I was home alone. The outside of the window is the garden which is only accessible through the back door of the house. There's so many experiences that I want to talk about, which happened in my hometown. I just want to point out, I've been on a few local ghost hunts, and I've met a fair few mediums. They've all said, I'm sensitive, which is apparently someone who isn't psychic, but is able to sense or see more than the average person, which honestly would explain a lot, because I have witnessed a lot of weird things. I visited my parents' house this evening for dinner, which reminded me of a few more experiences that I'd had in the house, which I'd missed from my previous story. So back when I was 18, I worked nights. I came home at 7am on a Saturday morning with my now fiancé. We used to work together, which is how we met. We were always super quiet in the morning because everyone else would still be in bed. We went straight into the kitchen as usual and clicked on the kettle to make a post-work brew before bed. I also forgot to point out in my last story that the very active dining room is the room attached to the kitchen. So you walk through it to enter the kitchen. Myself and my partner were quietly chatting away when we heard footsteps in the hallway which entered the dining room and abruptly stopped. We both heard as clear as day a woman started laughing. We both whipped our heads around thinking it would be my mom, but obviously there was no one there. Everyone else in the house was still asleep in bed. The following evening when I woke up, I spoke to my mom about what had happened in the kitchen. She told me that she had also been experiencing weird things going on in the house that week. At this point, we were used to the spirit of the man that lived in our house, but this was something else. It felt sinister. The following weeks brought some odd activity in the house. I and the rest of the household on different occasions heard a little girl skipping and laughing in the hallway. Female whispers and crying could also be heard in the night. My mom went to see a friend after this who was a psychic. She explained to my mom that this little girl had come into contact with her while in the local town. The girl had taken a liking to my mom and decided to follow her home. It wasn't the first time someone had come to see this psychic about this girl. Apparently, she had followed a few people home. We decided to get the house cleansed to send this girl home. However, the male spirit that we've nicknamed John still remains in the house to this day. Although the spirit of the girl has now left the house, there was something very unsettling about it being there. That atmosphere at the time changed in the house and everyone seemed on edge. Back in the day, I had a friend who lived next door to the local high school. I stopped over one night and refused to step foot in this house again. A bit of backstory. The school was built in the early 1900s. It's got a lot of history to it. I attended this high school growing up, just like nearly everyone in the town did. There were rumours of it being haunted, but most of the time everyone just put it down to it being a stupid story. Under the school was a number of tunnels. They were originally built due to the Second World War as safety precautions. The tunnels are still used to this day for storage. The story goes that one of the students was murdered in the tunnels by a group of teenagers. 
However, I've never been able to find any truth to the story. So I went back to my friend's house. The layout of his house was very strange as it used to be a pub back in the early 1900s. We were upstairs in his room, just talking. It was about 1 a.m. and it was just the two of us in the house. All of a sudden, through his bedroom window, was a flash of light. This obviously caught our attention, so we peered out the window. Directly out of his window, you could see the assembly hall of the school, which for some reason, all the lights were turned on. I looked at him as if to say, what the fuck is going on? And he said to me, just wait, you'll hear the singing in a minute. Lo and behold, we heard muffled singing coming from the hall. It carried on for about a minute and then abruptly stopped and all the lights switched back off in the school. I asked him what the hell that was and he replied, it happens fairly often. I've gotten used to it. We put a film on to calm my nerves as to what had just happened. Around an hour had passed and we heard footsteps from outside his bedroom door and it went eerily cold in his room. The pacing outside his door continued for just a minute and then stopped. I was terrified at this point, but he didn't look bothered by it at all. I told him to explain to me what on earth was going on. He said to me, this house is haunted by five ghosts. The old lady who walks back and forth on the driveway who could be seen through the kitchen window. She wore a scarf around her head and had a hunched back. The lady with no teeth, who would just stare at you, smile and then disappear. And the two children who could be heard laughing and playing together. He said he was used to seeing them all and they were harmless. He then paused, took a breath and said, and there's the one we call the tall man. He was the one outside the door. He would only appear when renovation was being done on the house. He didn't like change apparently, and he would make that known. Rooms where renovation was taking place would become freezing cold constantly. It didn't matter how warm the rest of that house was, that particular room would be stone cold. Things in the room would get thrown around at nights and someone could be heard pacing and stomping angrily about. The reason he was called the tall man was because of obvious reasons. My friend said he was seen him twice and he was nearly seven feet tall, in period clothing and wearing a top hat. After that night, he did say to me that he was unsure why he had made an appearance that night, as there was no renovation work taking place when I'd stopped there. We both got obsessed with trying to find out the history of the house, but couldn't find anything apart from the fact it was an old pub. I wouldn't go back to that house after that night, and every time I'd walk past the house on my way to school, I would get anxious and refuse to look at it. The town has a number of pubs, two of which are from the 1700s and still in use today. These two pubs are particularly haunted. The Cross Keys. The former coaching inn was built way back in 1746 and still stands and functions as a pub today. The infamous local serial killer, William Palmer, who poisoned a number of people, was said to be a regular there. There's a story of him poisoning one of his possible victims in that pub. The pub is known for cold spots, people's drinks moving, voices and footsteps in the cellar, and numerous accounts of shadow people. William Palmer was eventually caught, and he was hanged for his crimes. It's his spirit that people believe still wanders the pub. The Four Crosses. If you're ever on the hunt for a truly terrifying experience, the Four Crosses is the place to go. Declared as one of the most haunted pubs in Britain. The Four Crosses was built in the 17th century and again is still in use as a pub today. There's reports of a roundhead soldier from the Civil War who spotted in the ladies' toilets. As well as a woman called Emily who constantly cries. One of the locals from the early 2000s is said to have never left the pub after he died. A young man in the garage who committed suicide to also still used to reside here. The most common ghost is that of a little girl who's seen often in the downstairs bar. Police report this as being the black eyed girl from the local woods. But from my personal experience, it's not her. The Four Crosses hosts ghost hunts on a regular basis, one of which I attended a few years ago. 
We got started on our night with the usual tour of the building before splitting off into smaller groups. About six of us were sitting in one of the bedrooms, asking the usual, if there's anyone here, make yourself known. After a few minutes, the TV came on in the room and lit the room up with static white noise. This obviously shit us all up. After a few seconds, it switched back off again. Upon investigation, we found that the TV wasn't even plugged in. None of us had a logical explanation as to how this had happened. We moved our investigation into the attic of the building. Just a bit more history for you here. The wood beams in the attic were originally beams taken from a ship, so the wood beams are older than the building. This was told to us after a couple of people in my group, myself included, said we felt a bit motion sick. Apparently, it was a regular recurrence in that room. So, we got out the Ouija board to see if we could contact anyone. We did. We started talking to this little girl. She was scared and felt alone. She was trying to find her mother. She spelt out her name to us, Emily. Not the woman who's supposedly meant to be seen crying. We asked if she was buried in the cemetery across the road and she said yes. A few people went over to the cemetery and actually found the grave of a little girl named Emily. Throughout the night, we conducted a number of investigations where we heard whispers, creaks and odd noises. As we came to the end of the night, we placed a torch on the table and we asked Emily to turn it on, to which it lit up extremely bright. This was actually caught on video. I'll have to see if I can find it. Everyone seems to have a story about the four crosses and it is extremely haunted. It was one of the most active ghost hunts I've been on. It's close to the local woods, but people are unsure if they're connected. As I edge ever so closer to talking about the infamous woods, I thought I'd talk about one of the oldest locations in the town, which lies just on the edge of the chase, Castle Ring. Castle Ring was originally thought to be back in the Iron Age. Although there's no defined date, the area was believed to be over 2000 years old. Unfortunately, only the perimeter groundwork is there today. During the 12th or 13th century, a hunting lodge was built foundations of which are still visible. Rich in history, this small hill fort has a lot of stories behind it. From UFOs, to werewolf sightings, to the spirit of a nun. And as always, my own personal experiences of the place. So, let's get into it. Back in 2004, a local was driving past the car park that lies at the bottom of Castle Ring, when he spotted a hair-covered humanoid figure that crossed the road. Shocked by what he was witnessing, he slowed his car down and attempted to take a photo. He was quoted as saying it was about seven feet tall with short, shiny, dark brown hair, a large head, and had eyes that glowed bright red. The spirit of the nun is often seen near Castle Ring, near where locals would collect water. I was unable to find her backstory. People are unsure if she drowned here, was murdered, or is just somehow connected to the area. The abandoned windmill that lies just up the road from Castle Ring also has a sad backstory. Local folklore suggested that this windmill was built on an old pagan burial ground, which could suggest why it's so active. Two children also suffocated in the flower silo who are still reported to be active in the area to this day. The legend tells of a tall, black, shadow-like figure that was spotted as the children suffocated which is possibly the same shadow humanoid that was seen back in 2004. Earlier this year, while stuck in lockdown, I decided to take the dog for a walk as part of my daily allowed out once a day for exercise. I hadn't been up to Castle Ring for years, so I thought it would make a nice change to my usual walk. It was raining, so I knew hardly anyone would be out. I parked up and noticed my car was the only one there. I didn't think much of it, as this year has seen a whole load of weird. I started walking around the perimeter on the allocated path. As the path dipped into more of an enclosed wooded area, I started to feel very uneasy. I took out my headphones as something didn't feel right. My eyes started darting left to right as I felt like something was watching me. 
My dog, who loves everyone and everything, started snarling and barking at something in the woods. At this point, I decided to go straight back to the car. I picked up the pace and walked back on myself, constantly looking around. Out of the corner of my eye, something caught my attention. I snapped my head back around to catch what looked like a black shadow darting behind one of the trees. I ran back to my car and drove as quickly as I could away from that area. I now remember why I hadn't been up there in years. The last time I was up there, myself and a couple friends witnessed strange looking lights in the sky. The whole area just made me feel uneasy and even thinking about it gives me the chills. I know I'm not the only one to have experienced weird things go on up there. I thought it was about time I spoke about the woods. Stretching for 30 miles, Canuck Chase truly is a stunning place to go in the day. If you're stupid enough to wander up there in the night, make sure you don't go alone. However, just because you go in the daytime, don't think the light will protect you. The spirits and demonic entities of the chase are known to make an appearance throughout the day. In the 60s, two girls between the age of five and six were murdered. Their bodies were found on the part of the chase that is now known as Birch's Valley. This bit of history is important, so keep it in mind. So, let's get into it. The most famous spirit that haunts the chase is that of the black-eyed girl. She doesn't appear very often, but when she does, it causes a media storm. Back in 2014, a local was flying his drone over a dense wooded area of Birch's Valley. It was there he captured what looked like a girl with black eyes floating between the trees. It had been 30 years since the last sighting of this girl, but no one knows why there was such a long gap in the sightings. When sightings take place, a piercing scream of a girl can be heard. People flock towards the noise, thinking a child is in danger. No older than 10, the girl is known to stand there with her hands covering her eyes. She will then lower her hands to reveal the coal black pits that she has for her eyes. And within a blink of an eye, she'll disappear back into the woods. Every person that has witnessed her is given the same account. She does the same thing over and over. She will also only appear in the daytime. So, the murders that I was on about at the beginning of this... Some people believe that the black-eyed girl is the spirit of one of those little girls. It is said that around the time of the murders, another seven-year-old girl went missing, but her body has never been found. Just a bit more to add to this story that's slightly more close to home. Around 15 years ago, my father-in-law was driving back from work. He drove through the chase, just as many people do every day of their commute. He drove down the long stretch of road through Birch's Valley. He looked in his rearview mirror to see two very young girls sitting in the back of his car. He slammed his brakes on and swerved his car. He came to a stop and checked the back seat again. Nothing. The girls had disappeared. He explained to me in much detail what the girls looked like, from the colour of their hair down to the clothes they were wearing. He's convinced to this day that the spirit of those little girls who were murdered had made their way into his car. The chase is covered in paranormal activity, from the demonic pigman to the copious amounts of sports reported to have seen. I love going up there for the beauty of the area, but it always feels as if I'm being watched. Local folklore talks about a horrendously creepy looking creature that stalks people of the chase. Ask a local about the pigmen, they'll smile and tell you the story as if a ghost story to tell children. Ask them to go into the depth of Canic Chase with you, and you'll see the look of horror take over their face. The story goes that a woman who was accused of witchcraft became pregnant. She didn't want to bring shame on her family by having a child out of wedlock so she went deep into the woods to give birth. When her child was born, it was horrendously disfigured, supposedly due to the corruption of her practicing in witchcraft. 
she offered her child up to the woodland in hopes that she would be forgiven for the evil she had done. It's said she returned to the village where she soon died from a flu-like illness, taking her secret about her child to the grave with her. A few years later, people started to report a humanoid-like creature that had facial features that resembled a pig. He would watch the children from the village while he stood in the tree line, sulking. After a number of children went missing and livestock had been gruesomely killed and thrown around the farmland, the village soon became abandoned and reclaimed by the woods. Centuries went by when the local scout club was camping over the chase, close to where the abandoned village was. The scout leader recalled the story of the pigman. He told the scouts that if they sing a certain song, pigman would appear. So they all stood around the campfire and summoned a pigman. He is said to have appeared and murdered all of the group apart from one boy. From that day, the pigman has been known to roam the woods once again. Now, there's absolutely no proof to back up this story, which is why a lot of people state it as folklore. However, there have been numerous accounts of people seeing a man that stand in the tree line with unusual facial features. People have gotten close enough to see his demonic muted face. It's then that he will run back off into the tree line, making a blood curdling high pitched noise described as a pig squeal. Unusual footprints have been found in the area, yet no one can work out what animal it's meant to belong to. There have been a number of people reporting that in the evening, Just as the sun is going down, as the chase is quiet and calm, a distant, high-pitched pig squeal can be heard from deep in the woods. Kanak actually has a large number of pagans that live in the area. It's something that always seemed to have been a part of this town. However, it's a well-known fact that cults and those who delve in dark witchcraft have practiced it on Kanak chase. Could the pigman be a result of witchcraft? Or is this entity something else entirely? I still have more stories about the chase, but those are more UFO related. Tonight, I want to delve into Gaskins Wood, part of the chase that lies between Hednesford Hills and Cannock Chase. This small wooded area has a sorrowful backstory. Back in the First World War, a couple lived close to the woodlands. The husband went off to fight and the wife was left at home. Months later, the letters stopped coming and the wife believed her husband had died at war. She moved on and started a relationship with one of her neighbours. She soon fell pregnant. The husband suddenly returned home from war and upon finding out about his wife being pregnant, he murdered her in a fit of rage. It is said he dragged her body out into the garden and left her rotting there for two days while it snowed. He then took her to the woods where he chopped her up into tiny pieces and scattered her body. Eventually, after she was reported missing, he confessed to his crimes. The police were unable to locate her and the husband agreed to show them where she was. He took them to part of the woods where a water container was, of which he showed the police her head. He had stuffed it between the water container and a pipe. The rest of her body was never found. The woods is named after her murder. Their last name was Gaskin, hence Gaskin's Wood. This part of the woods is a popular area for teenagers to camp, and I spent a number of weekends over there when I was younger. I used to cut through these woods on my way home and always felt on edge walking through there. Sometimes I would run through it just to get through the woods quicker. The one night, myself and a group of friends camped up there. We were pretty loud that night and we were all just having a laugh, being usual teenagers. As the night drew on, we all eventually retired back to our tents. Around 4am, we were woken by the noise of a woman wailing and crying around the campsite. A couple of us got out the tent to see what was going on. Nothing. We stood about reassuring each other that we weren't going mad and that we all heard it. It was quiet. The air was still. No birds, no rustling of trees from animals, nothing. It was eerie. That's when my friend went pale. His eyes looking straight behind me, he whispered, What? What is that? We turned around to see a woman, 
battered and bruised, wearing a white nightdress, crying. But the thing that made us all stand there in shock and unable to speak was the fact we could see right through her. And just like that, she vanished right in front of us. It's safe to say we quickly packed everything up and were home by 6am. It's been around 10 years since I've stepped foot in that part of the woods and you couldn't pay me to spend a night there again. Back when I was 13, my great grand became very poorly. She was 93 at this point. She'd had an amazing life, but unfortunately, she was suffering from cancer. At this point, she was in the hospital of an end-of-life care. We knew she was going to die, and we were trying to make her as comfortable as possible. The one night I woke up suddenly and sat in bed. I remember seeing my alarm clock that said 3.04am. At the end of my bed, I saw my great gran she was holding hands with my great-granddad, who had died 40 years previously. She was holding a bouquet of flowers in the other hand, and she was smiling. She came to say goodbye. I woke up the next morning thinking about how weird the dream I'd had was, and how detailed it was. After brushing this off as a dream, I went and spoke to my mum about it. She went pale, as I explained in detail what I'd dreamed about. She told me that she had the exact same dream and she remembered the clock in her room saying 3.03am. My great-grandparents were both wearing and doing this exact same thing in both our dreams. At this moment, the phone rang. It was my granddad. He'd been crying but was clearly trying to hold it together for the sake of the phone call. My great-grand passed away overnight at 2.57am. To this day, I'm convinced that it wasn't a dream, and in fact, the spirits of my great-grandparents who came and visited myself and my mom to say goodbye. The house that I grew up in was haunted. It has many stories from all of my family, and from the previous owners, and even the people before them. Well, the house had issues. A lot of people refused to go back after visiting just once. So with that and just how old it is, no one wanted to buy it when my dad put it up for sale in 2011. In 2014, my fiancé and I took it over. Well, apparently during those three years that the house was on the market and empty, it wasn't empty. Someone broke in and took up residency. We were both package handlers for UPS in Louisville, Kentucky. This house was in New Albany, Indiana, which is 10 or 12 minutes away. We both worked the late shift and rode together, so at 11 o'clock we'd leave the house and get back around 5 or 5.30. Literally the second day we had gone to work after moving in, it happened. We walked in the front door. I went to the bathroom, which was after the kitchen. The kitchen also had a door, but didn't have a deadbolt, just a twisted knob-type lock. I walk in the bathroom and it smells like shit. The faucet is on, and I thought my fiancé left it on. I called her to the bathroom and said, hey, what the fuck, did you leave this on? The faucet was on and it wasn't a small drip. It was as if someone was washing their hands. Suddenly, I noticed it. After I turn the water off, I'm standing in the doorway of the bathroom. She's standing in front of me, but in the middle of the kitchen, with the kitchen door behind her. The door is wide open and I somehow didn't even notice it. She thought I had opened it to go take out the trash, but when we got home, I went directly to the bathroom. At this point, I told her to get behind me, and I unholstered my pistol, because yes, I carry. I went out back, walked around, and saw nothing. Locked the door, went back in, and checked the house. Found old food and bottles, shit stains, and it reeked of urine. All upstairs, in my sister's old room. Two days later, we get back from work and my back door is wide open again. This time I think it was to get their stuff. I think we almost caught them two nights prior and that's why the faucet was on. What's incredibly creepy though, is that literally the very next day after work, right across the street from my house was this homeless person. They were pushing a shopping cart with a blanket and a trash bag. This person had a creepy mask on. They were watching the house and when my car lights hit them, 
The person started to move it along, but very slowly. I still wonder if they were studying for hours, but it didn't matter. Same day, I went and bought multiple locks for each door. When I was either four or five, I was alone and asleep in my bedroom. I slept on a bunk bed, but my half-brother only lived with us every other weekend, so he wasn't there. I was completely knocked out, and then I started to wake up, but my eyes remained closed. I remember hearing my heartbeat fading, but with every heartbeat I saw pulsing black and red. I was trying to completely wake up, but after maybe a minute, I took a huge breath and opened my eyes. It was still dark outside, and I was breathing incredibly heavy. I was sleeping on my side and was about to raise my head and look at my closet behind me. As a kid, I hated my closet because the door would not close. It would close just enough to leave maybe a two inch dark gap. Remember, I'm in my bunk bed about five feet high. The bed is parallel to the wall and the ladder is on the front side of the bed. My head rests right in front of the ladder my closet is maybe six feet away, but along the same wall. So suddenly, I wake up and go to raise my head and turn to look at the closet and make sure it's still as closed as possible. Immediately, as I start to turn my head, a voice from directly behind my head stays, Stop. Don't turn around. I start to turn my head a little more. The voice then said, If you look behind you, and something along the lines of, We'll be dead and hanging on your back wall. As a stupid four or five year old kid, at this point I'm terrified, but, my, but turn my head really fast to face this voice, and nothing. I got out of bed to turn my TV and light on, and just sat there in terror for the rest of the night. It's been 21 or 22 years, and I can still see it so clearly. So at the end of the afternoon, I believe, I went to the basement, which was accessible from the outside instead of the inside. There was a single bulb which could be turned on after a set of stairs with a rope slash cord. This basement was mainly empty, made of concrete floor and wood walls. There was this one couch. It projected a shadow because of the light, but suddenly, when I looked, another shadow appeared. It was the figure of a man. It was a figure on the floor as if something was standing there but obviously nothing was. I was scared, but it got worse. It started running towards me. Have you ever had a shadow run towards you? Because I see nothing. I'm on stairs. I have a door which is easily blocked by anything. I had to almost bash the door for it to open, to which I always hated the basement and never went again. Each time I left my house, there was also a garage which wasn't ours, but right next on our property. My friend's dad owned the garage. There was a glassless window, which was always pitch black, even in daytime. From this window, you could hear something. My name is Zachary, and every time I'd walk past it, I'd hear Zack, Zack, Zack in the wind. Not just once, many, many times. And today was no better. Lately, I've done a spirit box session, which I received answers to, but not very clear. So that's to take very lightly. Why did I do a session? Well, I'm chilling on my bed, and occasionally, once every three weeks or so, I'll feel something. Like a person climbing on my bed. Not just a little weight, no. The bed literally feels and also makes the sound of someone laying down on it. It happened to me approx four times. There was also this time when me and my sister were home, but my parents were gone for a while, and we both at the same time started to feel chills, started to feel worried. My sister also mentioned she heard on the first night, get out. I've seen shadows in my room, but not a lot of them, only two since we're here, so it could be anything. When I was 17, I'm 24 now, I visited a cemetery at night with a small group of friends. We were just going to look at the graves, give a little love to the graves that looked like maybe no one visited them anymore because they were from so long ago. We weren't going there to hurt anyone or mess around with the graves, 
because we were, most of us still are, very spiritual, i.e. not religious. I'd always liked cemeteries and felt a kind of peace when I'm in one, so I was very comfortable there and relaxed. I think that may be why what happened, happened at all. I was following me at the back of the group, lingering on some graves to read what was written when everything, for me, goes blank. The rest of what happens is what my friends told me about hours later. <laughs> hey, this one's mine. I called to the person next to me in my group. He turned around to laugh and tell me to quit playing around when he stopped. I should have died, really. It wasn't my fault. What? What do you mean? He asked, getting my other friends to stop and walk back to me. Well, you see, I was playing in the barn with the kittens and the man came in with a gun and bang! I don't think they would have believed I wasn't the one speaking if the voice coming out of me hadn't been so much higher pitched and had a very, very, very country accent. I don't know why he did it. He was my daddy's best friend. For the next two hours, I led them around the cemetery, pointing out graves and telling them about the people buried there like I knew them. One of my friends had a phone out to use as a flashlight and recorded everything I was saying so they could face check when we went back to the house we were staying at. Eventually I stopped again, frowning at a headstone. This is my brother. He got to live a long, long time. It's not fair. I wanted to live too, I said, stomping my foot before just collapsing on the ground. I didn't wake up until we got home that night and I remember I had the worst headache of my whole life. My friends showed me the video. Then we all looked up as much as we could on the internet to see if I had been right. I was right about everything except one thing. The grave I had collapsed on top of hadn't been the brother of the girl who had supposedly possessed me. He had been the son of a father's best friend. The same best friend who she said shot her. I've never been back to that cemetery since. I'm afraid a little girl won't be the one to possess me this time. I was around six or so and my brother about ten. We had just moved to a new council flat where the previous tenant had passed away from old age. So this was around 1997. Before we moved in, my parents got everything in the house sorted. Furniture and such put into place. Me and my brother shared a room and on the first night when we were asleep is when we had our first paranormal experience. I won't say ghost because the way this ends may say otherwise. About two in the morning, we were both woken up to our TV bedroom, flicking on and off to static. The main light in the room flickering and the furniture cupboards and drawers opening and closing. This wasn't quiet at all. We were both so startled and scared and genuinely screaming for our parents. After about 15 seconds or so of no response from them, we ran out the room to our parents' room and found them in bed. The weird thing was the cold. We were pushing them and screaming right next to them, but they didn't wake up. They were both so cold. The last thing I remember of that night was looking into the hallway through my parents' bedroom door and there was just white light. That was it. My brother can't remember looking through the door, so it seems only I saw the light. Me and my brother then woke up from our beds about 8am in the morning or so. After my brother woke me in a panicked state, and looked at each other, and we talked about it. As we talked about it, we knew it happened. We ran to our parents' room again, and woke them to tell them about what happened while crying out of fear. We never did find out what happened or what was the cause. We stayed at my grandma's house for a week or so, before going back and having no real problems. At least not to that scale. My dad was a huge skeptic of the paranormal, but even he experienced the weird footsteps in the hall on occasion. The weird figure in front of the bathroom door at the end of the hallway. We were and still are a poor family with health problems on my mom's side, so there wasn't much we could do. It never bothered us much other than the weird sounds and sights every so often. This still happens to this day for them. I've since moved out with a friend. Me and my brother are still adamant on what happened the first night but we still don't know what happened in the end or how we ended up back in bed. This may be a ghost story, or for all we know, an alien abduction. We have no clues and no way to find out.
My parents were both born in Poland, but met and had children in Canada. My mom's house was out in the farmlands, but my dad's house was in a small town with a huge amount of history. The house he grew up in was a small house to begin with, but throughout had so many additions that it now resembles a small mansion. The house is also very poorly insulated, so the stairwell, basement, attic and all the hallways were usually freezing cold in the winter. Only the bedrooms have a radiator in them to maintain heat. The house has three main floors that are often used, and an attic with a fireplace. It really is a beautiful house. I always visited it in the summertime, and my sister and I slept on the top floor, just below the attic which was empty during the summer since my grandparents rented the floor out to students during the school months. I usually spent my summers there with my sister, but with our own schooling getting more demanding with age, we tended to stop visiting as often and spent our summers in Canada. I signed up for a teaching retreat when I was 18, which would give me all of my required volunteer hours for high school. I took an extra year of high school, and I would get to go to Poland to teach English to students in Krakow. I would spend one week in my dad's hometown visiting my grandparents, then drive out to Kakao the day the retreat started. So I was given the top floor to sleep in, alone, in a very big, cold house. You may remember how I mentioned I have a friendly slash lonely presence following me around. When I was there, I didn't feel them. I felt strangely alone or being watched in a cold way. The day of the retreat, I woke up and showered. Then after putting my clothes on, I turned to open the door. This bathroom door has one of those fogged glass windows at eye level. You can't see anything really other than shapes and shadows through it. I reach for the handle and before I get a hold of it, I see a tall figure approach quickly. Not taking steps, but just getting closer without bobbing up and down. It's an old house, so I would have been able to hear footsteps. I didn't. Then the door rattles with a loud bang and the figure is gone. Now this happened really fast, all within the second of me grabbing for the handle and looking up through the window when I saw the figure. I thought, maybe my dad's fucking with me. We usually play stupid pranks on each other. So I opened the door quickly, ready to catch him. Nothing, nobody, not even footsteps running away. Just a really weird feeling of confidence in the air, but not my confidence. Still trying to find a rational explanation for this, I walk over to the stairwell thinking, maybe he's just that fast. And I hear him mid-conversation with my 90-year-old grandparents. All the other people in the house, in the middle, if a heated conversation. Most Polish conversations are. Starting to feel like my brain was short-circuiting because this just didn't make sense. I ran through all the rooms, checking every curtain, window, closet. Maybe somebody broke in. Maybe a bird flew through a window and into the house, even though the window was closed and it was clearly human in shape. Anything to not believe it, because it really just felt unfamiliar and sinister. I later learned from the neighbor that the entire neighborhood was built on top of a very old and demolished graveyard. My mom's house always felt a little off. Not in a necessarily unsettling way, but in the way that you never really felt when you were alone. I've always been the silent and more observant type, so maybe that's why she targeted me out of my family. I never had a real definite feeling for her at first. Just this, somebody is staring at you right now feeling, which always forced me to push my back up against a wall in the living room and stare out at all the house. One time a bird flew into the window while I was doing this, but that could have been nothing to do with it. It really started to get bad after I watched Paranormal Activity, the first one. I feel like she follows me around and feeds off of my emotions. I saw this movie at my sister's boyfriend's house and couldn't sleep that night when I got back home because I felt that feeling like you know your friend is going to jump at you, just around the corner. You just don't know when. I exited my bedroom the next morning to find everybody had left, and I was home alone. I wanted to go to the bathroom, but then suddenly heard one of the metal kitchen chairs sliding against a stone floor in the kitchen downstairs. I stopped and called out to my family again, and no one answered. I went downstairs and saw one of the chairs slide back 
and make the same noise as I heard from my bedroom, the metal against stone, but nobody was around. I doubled back into my bedroom and blocked the door with my body weight, sat there until my parents came home, then rushed out to use the bathroom. After I moved out, that's when I felt her following me. That's also when I felt her getting closer to me and when I started to sense she was also a woman. She started sliding things across tables and misplacing things. I'd leave my phone on the table in front of the couch, not get up at all, then reach back for it and it's gone. I'd throw the couch apart thinking it's behind the cushions, check the kitchen and the bathroom and even throw the sheets off my bed thinking maybe I sat down there for a bit and forgot. I return to the couch with my hands in the air and there it fucking is. Sitting right on the centre of one of the couch cushions, I just threw it apart, looking for it. At that point, I just yelled out, Look, if you want to stay here, don't bother or disturb me. Don't hurt me. You can stay here only if you let me keep to myself, and you keep to yourself. Or something along those lines. After that point, things I know I lost years ago turned up in cabinets I didn't have at the time I lost them. I didn't hear footsteps around me anymore. My cats stopped staring at a corner and yowling. I still feel her watching. I know she's following me, but I kind of like her now. But I can't stop thinking, maybe she's waiting for something. I used to move around a lot, until my dad got remarried and we moved to the Midwest. The house I ended up spending the rest of my adolescence and teen years in was built two houses down from our small town cemetery. We were the first ones to ever own the land and build on it, so we were also the first people to live in our house. But that hasn't stopped weird things from happening. When I was 11, I had moved into the new bedroom in the basement and got one of those loft beds with a desk under the top bunk. One night, I woke up in the middle of the night to my TV going in and out of signal and then went back to sleep after I turned it off. When I laid back down, I felt something caress my hair for a solid 30 seconds. It wasn't threatening, but I just froze until it stopped and forced myself to sleep. We have always had a dog in the house and they've never acted weird. But when I was 14, My mum and I were cleaning a room in our basement to get ready for a slumber party I was having and we both heard what sounded like my dog coming down the stairs and stopping at the landing. So I went to greet him because he was getting older and stairs were a little more difficult for him. Well, he wasn't there. So I called his name and he was sitting in my parents room with my dad. I know my mum heard the footsteps too but to this day she denies it happened. Nothing happened again until I was about 16 and I was having friends sleep over. The four of us are pretty musical, so we had our guitars and ukuleles propped up against the wall or laying on the floor. The four of us all woke up around the same time at like 4am and heard the strings being plucked and strummed very gently. Today, I haven't heard or seen anything else of the ordinary. None of these little instances were ever threatening or scary, just peculiar. I would usually brush them off the next day, but my friends always believed it was a ghost or something. I'm a huge believer in the paranormal, but I've never really had any experiences that were undeniably spooky, so I never gave these events much thought. But now, I think maybe they're spirits passing through, because they were so near and far between, but also because I lived next to a cemetery. First, my mum is a diagnosed PTSD sufferer, and she has anxiety. So she has a hard time dealing with bad and sad things. She also tends to emotionally shut down when things get tough. She is in therapy and has been for nearly a decade. She had a really traumatic childhood. My grandmother, my mum's mother-in-law, died in 2019. My mum loved my grandma like her own mum. Her death was rather sudden. Dying of heart failure that she didn't bother really telling anyone in the family about. 
My mom also lost another mother figure to her around the same time. And my mom was also about 16 weeks pregnant at the time. She had me young and is only in her mid 40s now. The combination of the loss of my grandma, the other mother figure that was lost caused my mom to miscarry. She ended up needing a DNC to get the fetus out as it wasn't expelling naturally and was going into decomposition. The combination of all three losses had my mom spiraling. She was closing off to my dad, to myself, my sisters. We were all so worried about her. She was like this for a few months until she started to come back. Turns out she had a dream. In it, she saw my grandma and my great grandma, who passed away in 2006, sitting at my grandma's old dining table and drinking coffee. A sight that was common to my mom in the early days of my parents' relationship. My mom starts trying to walk to them, but for whatever reason, isn't getting any closer. And calling out to them doesn't do anything either. After a few moments of this, they both look over at my mom, and my grandma says, It's okay, we've got her. Before looking down into her arms, where a small bundle is held. Mom woke up right after. She needed a good cry, but it was right after that she was able to stop processing her grief of the deaths. Mom never found out what the baby she lost was, but named it Caitlin after the dream she had of my grandma. We all still miss my grandma so much, and her loss never gets any easier. I'm tearing up writing this, but every now and then, we know she visits. My mom, dad, 13-year-old sister and myself have all smelled her perfume when at home. My parents have heard her voice. My cousin Aidan even once saw her at a place he, his dad and my grandma used to meet up at all the time. My in-laws' house, and specifically their basement, has always given me the creeps. I don't like going into their basement by myself as I feel watched, and it's only in their basement. I was there on Sunday, by myself as my in-laws were out of town. I was doing laundry in their basement, and it was during the day, so it assuaged some of my fears. I had been doing laundry for a few hours, and out of the corner of my eye, I see a figure in the reflection of the TV. Obviously, I look up and see nothing. I tried to recreate what I saw as there are a lot of collectibles in the basement, but I couldn't. Then, around an hour later, I hear what sounds like someone upstairs. Keep in mind that I'm alone here. Even the cat isn't home at the moment. I go up, thinking it's just my sister-in-law, and nothing. An hour or so later, I hear someone coming down the stairs, and again, I go. No one is there. After that, the cat comes back in, so I can ignore some of the noises as he is a chunk, so I explain it to him. Around an hour before I leave, I hear a very audible floor creak from my in-law's bedroom. The cat is asleep in the mother-in-law's office, and again, I'm by myself. I never heard any creak speak that loud while I was there. The last time I was at my in-law's for laundry while they were gone, I saw a figure in the reflection of the TV. And I saw a figure that looked like a girl wearing one of those floor-length nightgowns standing right next to me in the laundry room. Each time I see something though, I could never see a face. And the time I saw it in the laundry room was the only time I got a pretty clear image of what was there. Now, some of the activity I can put down to the old dogs. My in-laws have two dogs, Max and Charlie, who died in the house. One was put to sleep and the other died suddenly of a stroke. I'm a firm believer that pets can stick around after their death, as two past pets of mine have done just that. But the figures I've seen have been human in shape, and there's no way around that fact. I lived in this apartment building at the edge of my city, from the time I was two to four. We had odd things happen in that place, I have weird dreams. My mom said that one day she heard me talking by the front door. She came and thought I was playing. Turns out 
I always look at a corner of the wall and just carrying on, as if I was having a normal conversation with a regular person. My mum was terrified, as she had the right to be, and asked, who are you talking to? And without missing a beat, I pointed at the corner I was looking at and said, that man over there, Bobby, can't you see him? Obviously, my mother couldn't see him. Another time, my mum was in the living room, and she heard this loud crash from the kitchen. She went in, worried that I had hurt myself, but instead, she sees a loaf of bread on the floor, and a broken lid. The lid was for one of those old-school Pyrex pots set from the 90s. Now, Pyrex is known for being really durable, and that particular lid had tumbled a few times. This shouldn't have broken it. It wasn't until recently, when we were talking about this particular apartment to a family friend, that we found out a couple years before I had been born, there had been a murder in my building. Freaked the fuck out of my mom when she found that out. When I was five, my parents and I lived in this apartment building. My family had been having many things happen. Seeing figures, noises with no explanation, our cat running around like she was being chased. We even have photo anomalies, parts of photos being really shadowed. This is one of the times the spirit focused on me. I was terrified of the dark, to the point where I had a nightlight. The bathroom light was on and shining light into my room, as well as street light coming in through the open blinds in my room from the main street we lived nearby. My room was so well lit, I could essentially read with no issue with my light off. This night in particular, I couldn't sleep. I'm laying in bed waiting to fall asleep. My parents were already in bed sleeping. When suddenly, my room goes pitch black. I'm talking so black that I wouldn't be able to see my hand right in front of my face. I look towards where my door should be and I see this large figure in the doorway with blood red eyes. Being the little five-year-old I was at the time, I screamed as I saw him begin to walk towards me, which wakes my parents. They don't get up and ask me why I'm screaming. When I can't get a coherent response out, they tell me to go to their room to talk to them. They didn't know what was going on. By this point, the entity is halfway from my door to my bed. I get the courage and run. I ran right through it. And as I hit where the entity is, it gets ice cold. I didn't stop though, till I got to my door. I turned around at that point and my room was back to normal. I then go tell my parents what happened. They felt horrible that they didn't come to me after I told them what happened. Over the years, people have tried to claim it was a dream. I know it wasn't though. My main reason for knowing is because when I was a teen, I stayed at a cousin's place. And I told her that story. She told me that she saw the very same entity between her and her son's crib one night. She lived a block away from my old apartment at the time. I moved to France over 20 years ago. My husband and I bought an old Maison Bourgeois, which was built in 1789. I've always been curious about the paranormal, and I've had some strange things occur in my life, but nothing prepared me for living in this house. The house needed a lot of work, but in the beginning, we just did some basic remodelling and updating. Shortly after we moved in, my daughter was born. We had invited quite a few out-of-town guests for her christening. My best friend was sleeping in a room we were using as a guest room. She's pretty pragmatic. And not really a believer in the supernatural. She was awoken by a sharp punch to her stomach. She said it was so forceful that she was actually lifted off the bed. My husband laughed and said that it must have been a nightmare, but this made me feel very uneasy. Already, I had experienced weird sensations and heard footsteps in the hallway. I had kept these feelings to myself. I decided to share my thoughts with my best friend. She was very unsettled by the whole episode and was reluctant to spend another night in the room. The next night, she was again hit in the stomach, although not as violently. At this point, 
We were both pretty freaked out about it. She left the next day to return home. Needless to say, she now definitely believes in the paranormal. This episode was just the beginning of the strange occurrences that happened periodically throughout my time living in this house. It was a large house, over 800 square metres with a hectare of land. It has three storeys. It has front and back staircases, and when you're in the front part of the house, you cannot hear anything that is going on in the back part of the house. My husband travelled a lot for work, and I was often left alone with my three young children. Since this was the case, we put in an alarm that had motion detectors in several rooms that might be vulnerable to a break-in. One such room was the playroom. We used it as a guest bedroom, but it had two doors and you had to go through this room to get to the playroom. The alarm in the playroom seemed to go off quite a lot during the dead of the night, around 2 to 3 a.m. This in of itself was enough to scare me when I was alone. I would go begrudgingly into the playroom to see what set off the alarm, only to find nothing. Sometimes one of the remote control cars would have moved, but basically nothing. We had the alarm company check it out, but they found nothing and said maybe a spider or an insect crawled in front of the motion detector. Overall, I had some pretty bad vibes in the room. One day, my son had a friend over. They were around six or seven. And they came to me running and acting a bit hysterical. They said they heard men talking in the room. I went there to check it out and I heard men talking but very muffled. I looked out the window into our garden to see if perhaps it was the gardener but no one was there. I couldn't find the source of the voices. They always seemed to be right next door no matter what room in that wing of the house I was in. I didn't want to show my son and his friend that I was scared so we left the room and I brought them to the kitchen. Of course, later when I told the story to my husband, he said I had an overactive imagination and I was influencing my son into thinking ghosts were in our house. Once, I heard a man and a woman talking when I was in this room. It was late at night, and I was tidying up after my children. My husband was on a trip, and I started to be frightened. I thought someone had broken in, but I also had a strange feeling that maybe it was something else. I called a good friend who came over with a baseball bat. She didn't hear anything and all of the doors and windows were closed and locked. I was starting to feel like maybe my husband was right, and I had an overactive imagination. This, however, was not the end of the voices. And later, several other people, many of them skeptics, also heard them. There are certainly parts of the house that see more activity than others. The activity is not limited to the house. The front yard of the house is quite large, with a circular driveway made of gravel. The whole property is enclosed by tall stone walls with a large gate, so it's not very easy to enter unless you go through the gate which is always closed, unless opened by an electronic opener. One day, when my oldest son was about 10 or so, we were playing around in the yard. He was running the circular driveway and I was timing him. Then I would run it and he would time me. About halfway through running a circuit, he came barreling towards me saying, Mommy, why did you do that? You scared me. I had no idea what he was talking about. I said, do what? I've been here the whole time. He said, someone was running right behind me and breathing down my neck. I felt like they were going to push me. The gravel was even crunching behind me. I immediately felt uneasy. I tried to reassure him, but I too had felt as if someone was walking behind me on the driveway on several occasions, only to turn around and find no one there. My daughter also had an experience walking from the front gate to the house one night. She said someone or something had pulled the scarf from her neck and threw it to the ground. She ran into the house hysterically, thinking someone had followed her inside the gate. We turned on the light to the yard, and my husband went to check it out, but nothing. 
My husband said it must have been a branch from a tree or bush, but honestly, I think it was something else. What? I don't know. It left me feeling very uneasy, and I didn't like to be out front by myself. Living in a house that's haunted is not at all like you see in the movies. Months would go by and there would be nothing else of the ordinary. There were times that I would even start to believe that perhaps I had an overactive imagination. However, when other people share the same type of experience, it's hard to discount what you were experiencing. When we first moved into the house, we needed to do some basic updating. The electricity was very outdated. The electricians were up in the attic which, to be honest, was not some place I really want to visit. Doing some rewiring. Some wallpaper was peeling off a wall they were working on, and I decided to take it off. Underneath was a drawing in black charcoal of a very tall figure in a stovetop hat. Creepiest thing I ever saw. Definitely not a child's drawing. It made a real impression on me, but I put it out of my mind. Years later, we were preparing to go on vacation. The car was loaded up, and my husband asked my oldest son to go back inside the house, to make sure all the lights were turned off, etc. After about five minutes, he came racing out the front door, terrified. There's a man in your room. My husband and I went inside and searched the house. No one was there. My son later told us he reached the landing in front of our bedroom. He saw movement in the room. He looked inside and saw a tall man dressed in black with a hat looking out of the window. The man then started to approach him with his arm out. He ran out of there as fast as he could. This experience so affected him that he would not sleep by himself during our vacation. He was about 11 at the time. We talked about it quite a bit during the vacation. My youngest son, who was four, said, Mommy, a man comes to see me at night. He sits in the chair by my bed. I tried to talk about this with my husband because it seriously freaked me out, but he chalked it up to overactive imaginations. I never saw the man, but on numerous occasions whilst I was sleeping, I would wake up feeling panicked and have the sensation that someone was standing over me. I would bore out under the covers and pretend to still be sleeping. It made me feel like a child who's afraid to look under her bed or needs a nightlight. Who was this man that both of my sons claimed to see? Was he the man in the charcoal drawing on the attic wall? They always seem to be in the next room, but when I go to that room, they seem to be in another room. It sounds like a muffled conversation. We remodeled our house and after work, I started to hear a woman humming. Always a cheerful tune, but not one that I knew. At times, I really felt as if I was going crazy, but a friend of mine heard it as well. We were having coffee in my kitchen when I went to the restroom. My friend heard the humming and thought it was me. She started having a conversation with me, expecting me to just be outside on the kitchen door. Obviously, I did not answer, as I was not there. When I came back, she told me about what had happened. I never told her about the humming lady. We both felt this was really strange, but oddly enough, we were not frightened. It just seemed that whatever was humming was not malevolent. This is probably the scariest experience I've had. Before we remodeled the house, we had a door in the kitchen that led to our yard. Our yard was full of very tall trees and was quite large. At night time, it was very dark from all the trees and in the winter months, darkness fell quickly. Several times while in the kitchen alone at night, I would see what seemed to be quick movement by the door to the garden. Sometimes the dogs were outside and I thought maybe it was them, but at other times there really was no explanation. Once I saw what appeared to be a very pale gold face looking in, no body was attached, just a face. But it was so fleeting, I could convince myself it was my imagination. One night, 
My babysitter was in the kitchen with me, helping to fix dinner. My two youngest were also in the kitchen. It was winter, so outside was pitch black. My daughter yelled, Mommy, the man just stuck his head around the door. My baby sister quickly opened the door to look out, and there was no one there. A few minutes later, my son said, There he is. We quickly looked, and we all saw a face looking in. I ran to the door, and my babysitter went outside with me. There was no one there. I turned on the outside lights, and we couldn't see anyone outside. We were all a bit freaked out. The dogs started to bark, but I was too scared to put them outside. I didn't want anything to happen to them. I quickly checked the doors to make sure they were locked. What was it? I have no idea. A ghost? Or an intruder? If it was an intruder, I'm not sure how they would have gotten in our yard, as it was enclosed by very tall stone walls. Whatever it was disappeared without a trace. I never saw another face in the window after that. In my town, we have a library that's almost as old as the town itself. When I was about 12, I was assigned a history paper in school. Since we got to pick the topic, I decided that I wanted to do it on the history of the town itself. I went to the library to get some research material. The library is actually a large two-story house previously owned by one of the town's original prominent families. The second floor was off limits unless you received permission from the staff to go up there because they store most of their historic documents and books up there. I was given permission to go upstairs to look through those books. I had no preconceived notions about the library, but I felt really creeped out upstairs, alone for some reason. I was going through the books trying to find something interesting, when from one of the side rooms I heard a loud bang, like a door being slammed, which was odd since they had removed all the doors. I feel really uneasy about being upstairs now that I'm there for a reason, so I decided to see what it was. Maybe a bookcase shelf gave out. I take a look in the side room and there's only an old school writing desk with a little plaque that says Mr. Putnam, 1885. The room's a bit cold, but nothing is out of place. A little confused, I shrug it off and go back to the centre room to keep digging through books. I finally find a book that covers what I'm looking for and sit down to start reading. I get a few pages into the book and nearly have a heart attack when I hear another loud bang from another of the side rooms. This time it sounded like someone threw a brick at the wall. I can see into part of the room and it looks like it was a nursery or playroom based on the tiny rocking chair and teddy bear next to it. For some reason, I was terrified of going into that room. I did anyway though, because I'm a dumbass. I walked into the room and turned to look in the corner. I wasn't able to see from outside. I froze in utter terror as I meet the eyes of a young woman in a white dress, hanging from the ceiling by her neck. She seemed to see me, but was motionless. I tried to yell, but just couldn't get it out. I was, however, able to break free of her horrific gaze and run downstairs and out of the library. I sprinted the six blocks home. It wasn't until I told people about it that I found out one of the maids that worked in the house had become pregnant out of wedlock and hung herself in that room. I still hate going near that library. One evening when I was about 15, I was home alone for the night. I lived in an older two-story home. I often felt uncomfortable by myself in the house at night, especially in my room since I had the door to our creepy attic. I spent the evening watching TV downstairs, adequately distracted from being by myself. At some point, I decided I was ready for bed and went upstairs to my room. I shared a room and bunk bed with my older brother, but he usually got home late and went to bed after me. Our bed was pushed in the corner of the room against the wall. The bottom bunk was mine. I was pretty tired, so I laid down and fell asleep, almost immediately. Shortly after that, I woke up to my brother sticking his arm through the gap between the side of the bed and the wall, slapping the wall. 
It's dark, but I can clearly make out his arms smacking against the wall. Annoyed, I tell him to stop and roll over to try and sleep. Of course, he keeps slapping the wall, but harder now. I'm getting angry at this point, so I tell him if he doesn't stop, I'm going to hit him. No surprise, but he starts slapping even harder. I'm done with his shenanigans. I roll over to punch him in the arm, but instead, just hit the wall. A little freaked out that he pulled his arm away so quickly, I got out of bed and ripped his cover off to reveal no one there. I'm officially in nope the heck out of their mode and scurry downstairs to spend the rest of my night scared and alone. So I used to have intense poltergeist experiences. Things in front of me would literally be thrown across the room. And once, I was on the edge of sleep when something grabbed my foot. I felt it and yanked me to the very bottom of my bed. The latest to that string of events was when about five months ago, before quarantine, I heard something while I was home alone running through the halls. Keep in mind, both of my dogs were with me and I have no cats. After that, things just stopped until about a month ago. When my mom and her friends over, they were all outside talking, from which I could see from my window. And all of a sudden, I hear a loud, constant banging on my door as if, if I didn't open it, it would bust open. So I swing it open mid-bang, expecting my little sister. But absolutely nothing, no one is there. No one is in the hall. I'm on the second story, so if someone would have ran down the stairs, I would have heard them. After that, things died down to the occasional bangs and things falling over, without any obvious solution, until last night. When I say last night was one of the most terrifying nights of my life, I mean it. It started when I went to visit my sister, who just moved into an old 83-year-old house. Then as soon as I walked in, I knew something was wrong. When I was alone, I did a little investigation, just asking if there was a spirit, give me a sign. Nothing happened until that following night. On our way home, I spotted some lights in the air, about 25,000 feet up. As we got closer, I realised they weren't moving now. If you may not know, helicopters and blimps could not go that high, and planes can't stay in one place, so that ruled out any of those, so I just labelled it a UFO, as in the actual term. That was around 8.40pm. So then we got home around 9.30. As soon as we walked in again, I could feel something was off. My dogs didn't run up to me like usual, and they weren't as hyper. Turns out one of them had done a number two in our game room, so I had to go clean it up, and our trash can is nowhere to be found. I look at the game upstairs, downstairs, in the kitchen, literally nowhere. Then all of a sudden, it appears in the middle of the game room. It's just a little event of last night. So I thought it was strange, but I just went along with my night. At around 9.50 is when I was heading to bed. As soon as I walked into my room, the ladder fell, hit my ceiling fan, breaking off the blade to which I have a picture of, and almost ripping out the fan. I quickly turn off the fan and then break the ladder down. At this point, I have no clue what's going on. I'm picking up pieces of the fan when I hear another loud crash behind. I looked behind me to see what it was, and literally nothing had fell. As I'm looking, I hear another crash behind me from where I was looking before. Again, I look, and nothing fell. This continues all night. I finish picking up the pieces and get ready for bed. At this point, it's around 10.30. I climb in bed, lay on my side as I always do, and clear as day... I hear something or someone running behind me, off the other side of the bed. I jump up ready to hit someone, but no one is there. Like a little kid, I check my closet and under my bed. No one. Also, I'm a small paranormal investigator, and turns out that the most activity I've got wasn't even in an investigation. It was in my own house. I try to lie on my side again, but every time I hear something running on the other side... So I lay flat on my back. 
I'm trying to recall everything, but it was so scary that it's a little hard to recall. So around midnight, I decided to lay on my back and not turn over no matter what. I do it for a solid 10 minutes. Hear the constant running. Then as clear as day, I see a little kid run from the bottom of my bed that I could see to my wall and vanish. I'm completely freaked out now, so I turn my lights on and just sit there. I've just moved into this room last month, and everyone who was in it before had always felt a sensation of being watched. So did I. I sat there till around 1.30am, then finally just passed out and go to sleep. And then I woke with strange noises at 3 to 3.30am. I have absolutely no idea what they were. They sounded like gurgling or growling of sort. Even when I was fully awake, I still heard it. That's when I heard a bang on my closet door. So I fling it open and no one is there. I don't recall what happened after this, but I remember staying up to sounds and weird things till around 4.30. Then finally going to sleep and staying asleep. And that was one of my scariest nights ever. So when I was a kid, I had the prettiest cat ever. Her name was Ansa. We got her in 2004 when I was five years old. She was the best girl and we were literally inseparable. She always came to sleep next to me and whenever I was, she would sit on my lap or near me. If she was outside hunting, she would come running whenever I called her. And if I was sad or sick, she would lick me and come lay next to me. She started purring every time I even looked at her and she purred loudly. Like she was the ultimate purr machine. We lost her when I was in the army, so I didn't have a chance to say goodbye. It broke me when I got the message from my mom where she told me my cat had died when she was sleeping. But then again, she was old, so I had been expecting it. We still had two cats, but still, nothing could replace her. And as much as I loved the other cats, she was special. After that, Whenever I'm visiting my parents' place and I feel sad or anxious about something, I start hearing this quiet, soft purring underneath my bed, and it sounds like her purring. The first time I heard it, I thought that's there's one of our other cats under my bed, but when I looked, I saw nothing, but I could still hear the purring. It's been almost two years now since she died, and last time I heard the purring was last Saturday. My room's door was closed, so I knew there were no other cats in my room. I needed some alone time because my family can be a bit exhausting at times, and I was just laying on my bed feeling a bit down, and I started hearing it again. The soft purring under my bed. Nowadays, I don't even bother checking it because I know I can't see a cat there. I just accept it, but it does calm me down and makes me feel better. So whatever the purring is, it helps me. I just like to think that it's my pretty girl still wanting to make me feel better, like she did when she was still with us. My boyfriend can sometimes see dead people. I can't. He said that his first encounter was with his stillborn big brother when he was about five years old. He met him in a school toilet and they talked a little. And then he disappeared and he didn't see him again. Until recently. Now, my boyfriend's apartment's hallway and toilet had always freaked me out. I always felt like there's something there watching me. The first time I had that feeling I was in the shower. And I could have sworn there was someone on the other side of the curtain. I was literally shaking because I was so afraid. But when I slid the curtain to the side, there was nothing there. Once when I was watching the TV... I saw a reflection from the window. It was a dark figure moving away from the bed. To the hallway. My boyfriend was cooking in the kitchen, so there was no way it could have been him. I didn't tell him about it, because I didn't want to freak him out, and I was doubting my eyes. I've also seen shadows in the hallway mirror, but again, I was doubting my eyes. My boyfriend has insomnia. And one night he was on the couch playing mobile games while I was sleeping on the bed. I often have nightmares, and according to him, I was acting restless again. 
He turned to see if I was okay, and he saw a dark figure standing at the edge of the bed. It left immediately when my boyfriend saw it and disappeared in the hallway again. My boyfriend sat the rest of the night at the end of the bed, protecting me from whatever it was. That morning, I told him about the dark shadow figures I had seen. Once, when we were coming back from the store, my boyfriend started to open the door with his key, but the key didn't turn. He tried many times, and when it finally turned, he had to pull hard to get the door open. Later, he said that it was like there was something pulling it back. When he finally pulled the door open, I saw the air move inside the hallway, like on a warm day outside. When we stepped in, we felt really weird, like we're not welcome there. Then one night, we were watching a movie at his place. I had a migraine, and I started to feel sick and overall super tired and grumpy. When the movie ended, I crawled to bed and my boyfriend joined me, hugging me and trying to make me feel better. It was about 1.30am when suddenly all the hairs in his body stood up and he froze. He started squeezing me even tighter, almost hurting me, and I told him to let me go. He loosened his grip and turned to me and said, Honey, I don't want to scare you, but there's someone behind the front door. I was confused because I couldn't hear anything and we couldn't even see the door from the bed. He stood up and walked to the hallway. Suddenly, he kind of jumped, backed off, and stared at the corner. He stood there for a while and reached his hand forward. My migraine disappeared because I was so scared. I didn't know what was going on. I couldn't see whatever my boyfriend could see. I thought it was the shadow I had seen before. After a while, my boyfriend came back. He seemed calm and just said, he's gone now. I was just staring at him, and then he continued, I think it was my brother. He was just smiling and looking at me. We then talked and he said he didn't feel scared at all when he saw the man. Like he felt warm and loved. The man was young. Like my boyfriend's brother would be and had the family ears. I painted my boyfriend's family's coat of arms on the wall before and the man had stood right next to it. My boyfriend thought he came to warn him about something but he wasn't sure what it was about because he didn't say anything. Nevertheless, my boyfriend seemed happy about the encounter, and I was happy for him, but I was getting more and more scared for some reason. Then, maybe half an hour passed. We were just talking about his brother and his family, when my boyfriend got goosebumps again. He looked at me and whispered, he's back. But this time, he looked a lot more worried. He jumped out of bed and ran to the hallway. He stood there for a while, and then he ran to grab a candle. While he was running, he told how he felt something freezing cold come through the front door and go through the toilet wall to the kitchen. He shut all the windows, lit up the candle and blew the candle. The smoke rising from it went crazy. It spiralled all around the kitchen, but there was no wind inside. My boyfriend backed off and came to the bed and grabbed me to protect me. He told me that he thinks it's a poltergeist and his brother's fighting it. We sat there for a while, but then suddenly I felt completely calm, like a weight had been lifted. My boyfriend felt it too, and we looked at each other. He whispered, I wonder if it's over. And right after that, our dustpan that was leaning against the wall fell over. He smiled and said, I'll take that as a yes. I guess my brother would. After that, we stayed awake for a long time, talking about what had just happened. I kept telling him to thank his brother for protecting and warning us. After that, we haven't seen or felt anything weird in his apartment. I'm 21, and until now, I've never really believed in paranormal stuff. i always tried to find a logical explanation for everything. I met my boyfriend about four months ago. And he told me he can sometimes see dead people. I thought he was joking and trying to freak me out, but he was dead serious. And I don't see why he would lie to me about stuff like that. Also, a few things that have happened have really made me doubt myself. Okay, so first off, I used to think I've never seen dead people. When I was a kid, I saw a dark figure standing in a doorway at my parents' place once. 
but I can't remember if it was a nightmare or not. I also saw a lot of nightmares about a small girl living in our storage room. My parents' house is well over 400 years old. I still sometimes get the feeling that someone's following me when I'm visiting my parents, but I used to think it's just anxiety. I haven't told any of this to my boyfriend when we first went to my parents. When I showed him the house, he seemed uncomfortable in some of the rooms and kept staring at what seemed, to me, like emptiness. He asked if people had died in the house, and I told that probably many people had died there because it was such an old house, but I only knew of one. At that point, I didn't know what he could see dead people. He also was really uneasy when he met my grandpa, and it seemed a bit odd, but I thought he was just nervous. The next night was the one when he talked about his ability to see dead people. He told an out seeing people sitting on the chairs. He also talked about seeing an old man that looked a lot like my grandpa, and that's why he was uneasy with him. Because at first, he wasn't sure if my grandpa was alive or dead. I showed him a picture of my great grandpa who looked exactly like my grandpa, and he said that he was the man he saw. He also described seeing a fat man dressed in early 1900s clothes, wearing glasses. And I showed him a picture of the man who owned the house before my family. My boyfriend confirmed it was him. Then he told me about the presence at the doorway, the same doorway I saw the nightmare about, but he didn't know about that yet. He said he couldn't see anything, but he said it felt like he walked through something freezing cold. And when I went to get a fan from the storage room, because it was really warm in my room, he stayed at the door and noped off, and told me that someone had grabbed and brushed his foot. Now this was the same room I used to see nightmares about too, when I was a kid. It just freaks me out, because he had no way of knowing about my nightmares, or what the people living there used to look like. I'd like to learn more about stuff like this, but I don't want to ask him too much, because he's had really bad experiences with dead people. It's a really easy way of approaching him about this. Also, these aren't the only weird things that have happened after I met him. These are just the ones that made me doubt my thoughts. I already knew about this ghost before this experience. He died in a house fire in the 80s, and when a new house was built on top of his old house, he decided to occupy it. He was friendly, never tried to harm me or scare me, just wanted to have fun at our expense. Tuesday night, my roommates are gone. Sweetness, I have the house to myself. I just finished making dinner. I was watching a movie while my laundry dried. It's done. As I'm walking back to my room, I pass the front door and notice it's unlocked. I'm about to go to bed, so I might as well lock it now to save time. Fold my laundry, now back to the movie. But my cat starts crying at the door like he wants out. When I go to let him out, I open the door and he runs out. That's weird, I thought to myself. I could have sworn I locked the deadbolt. I must be tired. It's bedtime. As I'm laying in bed, I can't help but shake this feeling. I don't know what it is, but I can't sleep. So I get up and just walk around. I walk past the front door. It's unlocked. Now, I know something is up because I definitely locked it like half an hour ago. What the fuck is going on? I lock it again and walk to the kitchen for a snack. Munching on my snack, playing on my phone, I hear a click come from the front door. It's unlocked again. Nobody outside, my roommate's cars are all gone. What the fuck, yo? I lock it and sit there, waiting. A couple of minutes go by and sure enough, the deadbolt turns unlocked on its own. So I lock it again and wait. I sat there straight eyeballing that deadbolt in silence. Just as I predicted, it starts to unlock itself. Uncle Jim, I know that's you. I know that's you. I'm tired and want to go to bed. We can play tomorrow. The lock stopped rotating and then returned to the locked position. I left, came back an hour or so later and it was still locked and was still when I woke up the next morning. Uncle Jin didn't come back the next day to play. Me and my sister were very young, 
And we had a full-time maid babysitting us because our parents were working. I was probably nine and my sister was six. The house helper was 40. So I've always been into such stories of the unknown and I was a weird kid. Not surprised something like this happened. I was with my sister and the sitter. We were all lying down. I was on the bed. My sister and the lady were on the floor mattress. We were chatting and singing songs, nothing related to ghosts. And suddenly we heard in the center of our position, a loud clap, a very distinct and clear loud clap. And we were looking at each other so we knew it wasn't any of us. It was such an intimidating sound, like a clap made by someone with stiff hands. We looked at each other as if asking about it, and none of us could understand what happened. My sister wanted to use the washroom, and that sitter insisted we shouldn't move. Anyhow, I convinced her. As we were sitting in the living room and the washroom was in another room, we had to go there. We formed a line and went in, and to our shock, the washroom was locked from inside. Now we literally got terrified over thinking about every scenario possible and more than the probability of a ghost. We thought there might be an intruder. It was in an apartment, so we called our neighbors from the flat below. They broke into the washroom and called us to be at their place for a while. The lady never came back the next day because of how scared she was. That building was in fact creepy on its own. We were the only two families staying there and the topmost floor was occupied by some college students. That house had a few weird incidences throughout our stay. I told my mum about it and fortunately she believed us. She felt strange in the house too. We were staying there for four or five years already. In the beginning all the people left and we too were the only families staying there. We left that place too because we were fairly unsafe by the passing time. Though a few years later, my dad changed that apartment into his office space, and he never felt anything there. But, my sister and I still remember that it did happen. We got goosebumps talking about it once, so we avoided touching it. When I was a baby, my mom and dad attended a funeral for her best friend's dad, who had committed suicide. Her dad was a security guard who worked second shift. Every night he would come home, eat his dinner and have a glass of whiskey at his seat at the table. One night he came home, ate his dinner, drank his whiskey, then shot himself. After the burial, a small group of people went back to the house for lunch and drinks. My mom and dad were one of the first people to leave because I was still a baby. My mom told Jean, name changed, that she would call her the next day to check on her. The next day, my mom calls Jean and she tells my mom to come over because she wouldn't believe what she had to tell her over the phone. Mom, go to Jean's house and get told what happened. Around 10 o'clock the night of the burial, Jean and her family decided it was time for bed. Jean had two sisters and a brother, all of whom lived out of state, and she lived at home with their parents. They cleaned up the house from the guests they had over, including washing and drying the dishes. They all went upstairs to go to bed. Sometime in the middle of the night, one of the sisters got up to use the bathroom and heard a noise coming from the kitchen. Then, what sounded like footsteps going into the dining room. Didn't think anything of it until she saw everyone was in bed. So she woke up the brother, who then woke everyone else up. He grabbed a baseball bat and led his mom and three sisters downstairs to see what was going on. They go into the kitchen and see one of the cabinets open. He could have sworn it was shut when they went to bed, since he put the dishes away. Then he went into the dining room where he lost it. He turned on the lights and saw that the chair their dad used to sit in was pulled out, like someone had been sitting there on the tablecloth was what looked like a ring of condensation from a glass. They all freaked out and ran upstairs. A few days went by and Jean went to the store to pick up some pictures from a roll of film she had dropped off the day after the funeral. As she looked through them, her face turned white. She showed her mum a picture that was taken with everyone around the dining room table, and in the middle of the picture, where her dad's chair was seated, was a faded figure of her dad.
This is all from personal experience. My parents divorced when I was very young. And I chose to stay with my mother and my sisters. So I looked up to my grandfather as a male role model ever since. Sadly, he passed away when I was six or so, so I didn't really have a chance to talk about the true things of life with him. However, he made sure to teach me valuable lessons through his stories. As far as I know, he was horned by a bull. A train rammed his truck, which left him with more than a hundred stitches all over his body. He fell to the sea on a fishing trip, got lost and was presumed dead before washing ashore two days later. Was a member of the National Secret Service, which I could verify myself through an ID my grandma kept under lock and key. But you know teenagers. This is not in the US, by the way. He survived two types of cancer. The third, he didn't, however. And many other accidents accounted for in pictures, newspaper articles, and the tales of my grandmother and her children, my mom included, that you'd have a hard time believing. But I digress. The day he passed away, I remember coming home from school to find my mother crying at my grandmother's place for dinner. We live two blocks away. He tells me Grandpa has left the building and starts sobbing, urging me to do so if I wanted. Oddly, I was totally aware of the fact he wouldn't be coming back from the hospital, where he used to go a couple of times a week for treatment, and did not feel the need to cry, weep, sob, mourn or whatever. In fact, I felt my grandfather was with me at the moment. I just hugged my mom and tried my best to cheer her up by saying, don't worry, I'm sure he'll hang around for a while. You may argue I was a child with a totally oblivious idea of death, but having had an accident around that time in which I almost bled myself to death, which ended up saving my life by allowing the doctors to detect my type 1 diabetes, on which I quickly became pretty well versed, having read my first encyclopedia by the age of five, I was quite calm and had another level of understanding about such themes. I knew my grandfather was there and from then on, would follow and protect me as a sort of guardian angel. I remember the old man used to love fishing. Sometimes we got up real early on weekends and went fishing at the beach. For the fun of it. A week after he died, I had this dream of an ideal lake. Your typical Eden surrounded by a lush forest and wildlife. We, my grandpa and I, were sitting in a boat, fishing rods in hand, silent and smiling. Enjoying the calm weather, listening to the waves caress the shore. The faint buzzing of insects roaming by and the occasional squirrel or deer showing up. As time went by inside my dream, dark clouds started to show up on the horizon, engulfing colour out of the forest itself. Everything turned dark and withered into a lifeless and rotting parody of the lively picture that surrounded us. Trees, plants, the fish, the water... All life forms were consumed, almost as if torched from their very inside. I remember I was calm, but I can't recall how somebody would be calm with such visions of death just making their way around me. The eyes of my grandfather turned into a blazing star, which I'll never forget. He opened his mouth in a furious roar, and then just vanished. We never said a word, but I knew this was his farewell. Days later, my mother was looking at some pictures of the old man, and amidst them, I found one of the places I had seen in my dreams. She tells me it used to be a ranch she owned way back before I was born, when she was very young. I had never been there, not even as a baby, but I described it in great detail to her. She just burst into tears and hugged me. Some years later, I was like 16 or 17 and lived at my grandma's. I had a very peculiar dream. I was relaxing and pretty much doing nothing besides one of your typical old classic muscle cars in the street in front of my grandma's. Nearby, resting on the car's back bumper, was a rectangular thing which I can only describe as the frame of a mirror. Out of nowhere, a very sick looking water-like surface appears in the mirror. Think of it as the effect of the paintings in Super Mario 64, but with enhanced water caustics. A single drop of liquid blasts out of the waves on the surface and floats until it's about a foot away from me. Then a blinding flash of light spans from the drop and my grandfather appears in front of me. He looked just as I remembered him, an aged man, half bald, with a very serene look. 
his body tanned and more skinny than athletic. However, he seems to be full of life in a way I can't explain. It's like knowing somewhere inside someone's eyes there's a child waiting to burst into hyperactivity with a sugar rush. He dusted off his clothing and greeted me in a way I felt I was more like a friend of his rather than his relative. Of course, by now, I knew my jaw was open and I was being severely mind-fucked in a dream. But nonetheless, I kept my composure and greeted him, asking how he was, telling him how much I missed him and all that jazz. He asked how everybody was, said he was watching me and was proud of me, that I was doing well and taking care of my sisters and my mother. We chatted about the last years, and I couldn't resist the temptation to ask him where he was, and how stuff was going, wherever he was. He says, and I remember vividly, he said that place was like an infinite, pristinely white corridor filled with doors. No matter which door you choose, when you opened it, you could do whatever you wanted, with whoever you wanted, and whenever you wanted. I remember he described how he was having a great time horse riding, taking care of cattle, and spending days playing domino and smoking cigars with his friends. Activities, I recall, were his greatest pleasures in life. There were no limits to what you choose, imagined, or wanted to do. I was amazed by his description, but decided not to ask further. At some point, he said he had to go back, because he had been granted permission to visit us for the night, and his time was about to finish. Once again, he sent his regards to the family in two specific messages. To my mother, he recommended checking herself at the doctor. To my grandma, he told her she could sell the ranch. Times were hard, but he prohibited her from selling the house. He had built it and would stay in his family forever. No questioning. As soon as he finished, he waved away and threw himself into the liquid mirror, back into wherever he came from. I saw myself turning around and feeling a breeze in the dream, just as I woke up. When I woke up, I remembered everything perfectly and pieced all this in my mind as a rather creative and intriguing experience. I was shaving early in the morning when my grandma came around and I decided to tell her everything about the dream. To me, it meant nothing. But when I finished, I turned around and saw her face distorted into a mix of shock and disbelief. I was more surprised about her expression and asked what was wrong. Nothing, she said. It's just that today it is death's 10th anniversary. I also delivered the message to my mother. She was confused at first, but guess what? The medical check found a tumour, which fortunately was detected so early on, it could be extracted without any risk. She was scared when they first told her, but pulled through and is perfectly healthy now. I swear I don't know what to think about this. It's been a couple more odd experiences which I will tell another time, but for the time being I trust that somewhere out there, my guardian angel is enjoying a cigar, watching, proud of his first grandchild, me. This happened to one of my friends. He and two of his buddies decided to go camping one weekend in the Uinta Mountains, Utah. They wanted to go out in the middle of nowhere to really get away from civilization and just chill and fish and stuff like that. All three of them are pretty outdoorsy and experienced with camping and backpacking, so this was no big deal for them. They went to a trailhead in the Uintas, hiked about half a mile up the trail, and then turned off the trail and just hiked for about four miles away from the trail. They had little trail markers so that they wouldn't get lost coming back. They find a spot and there was no sign of anyone around. The ground looks untouched by humans. There was also a brook close by so they decided to set up camp. All three of them had camping hammocks. So they set those up in trees and then just kind of explored around for a bit before they decided to build a fire and eat and stuff like that. Eventually, the evening rolled around. So they built a fire and made tin foil dinners and were just shooting the shit. When they decided to go to bed, the guy who told me this said he remembered laying in his sleeping bag in his hammock, thinking that even though there was the sound of the water in the brook close by, and every now and then there'd be like insect noises or whatever, the woods were so quiet. Like, being out of civilization 
made him realize how rarely we as humans experience real silence, since we all fill our days with so many noises and distractions. He said it felt eerie. He could feel himself starting to doze off when the worst thing in the world happened to him. He had to pee when already being comfy and warm. He figured he'd rip the band-aid off and go pee before he fell asleep for the night. He put on his hemp lamp, got out of his hammock and walked about 30 feet away from his buddies in their hammocks to pee. When he was walking over, he thought he saw something dart out of sight unnaturally fast and heard a crack of a branch. But because they were so far out in the wilderness, near a brook, he didn't think too much of it. He unzipped his pants, peed, and then went right when he was zipping his pants back up. His headlamp shone on something on the ground that paralysed him with fear. A few feet away from where he was peeing was unmistakably fresh human footprints on the ground. It had rained in the mountains the day before, so the earth was soft in some areas, and there was no doubt in his mind that these were not only human footprints, but that whoever made the footprints was barefoot. The creepiest thing was that the footprints weren't staggered. They were side by side, facing where the guys were camping. It was as though someone was just standing still at the edge of their camping spot in total darkness, just watching them. Those were the only footprints my friend could see. No other prints leading to or away from the ones he saw. Totally freaked out, he ran back to his hammock and got his knife that he always takes camping. He loudly whispered his two friends' names, but they were already asleep so they didn't answer. He debated whether he should wake them up, but decided against it because there was no real physical threat he could think of that would justify waking them up. He put his headlamp on a brighter setting and shone it up in the trees and around the general area of where he had peed. Nothing. He didn't sleep that night. He laid in his hammock wide awake with his knife in his hand all night. Those footprints looked as though someone had been standing there moments before he walked up to that spot to pee. He felt like he and his friends were not alone. When it reached early in the morning, when the sun just barely started to rise, my friend decided he was going to pack his stuff up because he was still spooked and wanted to start hiking back to their car when his friends were up. When he was taking down his hammock, he saw another set of fresh footprints. But this time, they were like 10 feet away from his hammock. Like on the edge of the trees behind his hammock. As if someone had been standing about 10 feet away from his hammock, just staring at him. Again, no other footprints leading to these two footprints. He was full on freaked out by this point, so we woke up his friends and showed them the footprints. And they got the hell out of there. Sometimes... You're not as alone as you think you are. Back in the 80s, my aunt Kay was in her early 20s. This was before she married my uncle, and when she would drive long distances back and forth between her parents and my uncles to visit. It was a transitional period for them. He had just graduated, and she hadn't moved out yet to be with him. It was a long drive across several states, through the desert, which took her hours. This desolate highway would have stretches of road that lasted hundreds of miles, where you quite often wouldn't see another driver, let alone a gas station. So Aunt Kay set out and began one of these journeys. A couple hours into the drive, she noticed a dark vehicle slowly catching up to her. She barely noticed. As she continued to sing along to a tape, until the vehicle got aggressively close. She turned off the music and looked into her rearview mirror, seeing the vehicle flash its brights and a hand pointing at a car and monitoring to pull over. Alarmed, she quickly slowed and began to look for a good place to pull off the road, to see what must be wrong with her car. The second she began to pull off the road, she said she felt and heard as clear as day, don't pull over. Then again stronger, don't pull over. Call it God, intuition, or just a gut feeling. But a jolt of adrenaline and fear shot through Aunt Kay's body as she hit the gas and peeled back out onto the highway. Heart pumping, she silently asked herself what the hell that was. And she saw the vehicle peel out behind her. The dark vehicle continued to closely follow, flashed their brights and motioned for her to pull over. 
Fear and confusion set in. She began to question what was going on. Why was the driver motioning for her to pull over? Was there something wrong with the car? What the hell was that warning she felt? It would have been a severe situation if her car broke down out there, especially before cell phones, but she pressed on. Just as her resolve wavered, she started questioning if she truly did feel what she felt. She started slowly back down when the dark vehicle picked up speed. It entered into the oncoming traffic lane and came to my aunt's car. The driver smiled, pointed, motioned and mouthed the words pull over to my aunt. She said the second she looked into his eyes, she felt pure evil. She felt a horribly sick feeling in the pit of her stomach and again heard the words in her head, don't pull over. She described him as looking scary, greasy, and noticed he was missing a couple teeth in his smile that she'll never forget. That sent chills through her. This quickly dispelled any thought she had of pulling over, and she put the pedal to the metal to try to lose him. He chased after her. She slowed down. He slowed down. She sped up. He sped up. It got to the point that he began to try to push her car off the road. Aunt Kay was to the point of tears as this creep continued to terrorise her alone, out in the middle of nowhere. Finally, after what felt like an eternity, she sees a couple of semis off in the distance. She felt if only she could get close or even get in between those trucks, she would be safe, so she took off. He continued to flash his lights, honk his horn, and try to hit her car, until she got close enough to the trucks. As she got in between them, she saw the dark vehicle slow way down, and eventually disappear from view. She stayed with the trucks for a couple hours until she felt safe enough to pull over at a gas station and cry. Fast forward several years. My aunt and uncle are married. He's working at a law firm as a high-profile criminal prosecutor in Las Vegas. She's now a full-time mom of several young children. Since I've known my aunt, she's been obsessed with true crime. Dateline, 2020 and Unsolved Mysteries were always playing at their house. This day was no different. She was folding laundry in the kitchen while listening to the TV in the other room. The interviewer was talking about a man who was being interviewed on death row. As she paired another match of socks, she heard the man describe one of his tactics for procuring victims. According to him, he would wait along the side of the highway. The car would go by with a family and he'd wait. Another car with a male driver would go by and he'd wait. But every so often, a car would go by with a pretty woman driving alone. So I'd pull out behind and follow them. I'd flash my brights, honk and motion for him to pull over. Aunt Kay, paralysed, continued to listen. When they would eventually pull over, I'd tell them to pop the hood, and I'd be able to tell them what was wrong with their car. They would, and I'd yank a couple of wires. When the car wouldn't start, I'd tell them no problems. My buddy has a shop in the next town. I can give you a ride and he'll give you a fair deal. My aunt slowly moved into the living room. They'd get in and I'd rape and kill them. Bury them anywhere in the desert. When asked how many times he did this, he responded, They'll never find all the bodies. I can't even count. And how many got away? Two or three. My aunt stood alone, staring into the same toothless grin she saw on that highway that day. It was Henry Lee Lucas. I was with my girlfriend preparing dinner. The year was 2015. Everything seemed normal. I put on some music and the speakers were in my room. While we were cooking, I noticed that the music was no longer being listened to. I was surprised that something happened with the internet because it was Spotify. I went to the bedroom and I noticed that the playlist continued, but the volume knob had been set to zero. I didn't pay much attention to it at that moment. I set the knob again and went to the kitchen to continue with dinner. Not even two minutes passed when again I noticed that no music was being heard. This time it seemed something strange to me. I lived alone and we were just my girlfriend and I. I went into my room and this time the knob was on one so I could lightly hear some music. I was surprised because it was a physical and not digital fault. 
Again, I turn the knob and return to the kitchen. I try not to think about that and concentrate on cooking, when suddenly, I clearly heard things on the floor this time in the studio that was next to my room. It bothered me the idea of passing by these things, instead of enjoying a pleasant evening with my girlfriend. I asked her if she had heard that sound and she said no. I replied that it was clearly a noise from the studio, so she told me, let's take a look. In effect, there was things on the floor. I wanted to think that it had simply fallen. We picked them up, turned off the lights and left. We were in the kitchen again when we heard another noise. This time, she could also appreciate it. I told her something is happening and she, being a very religious person, told me not to worry. We went to the studio and this time, the light was on and there were again some things thrown away. There were no open windows or wind currents. It seemed very strange to us. We lifted everything and before leaving, I pronounced aloud that I will leave the light on and we retired kind of nervous. We hadn't reached the kitchen when noises were heard again. This time I was really afraid that it was a thief who had entered the house. We ran to the study and the light was off and the TV that was there was on with static. We looked at each other and I told that it was not normal that something was happening and we should do something. She proposed to pray. We went to the kitchen, she took my hands, we said two prayers that she knew and when she finished, something was heard again. I wanted to go see, but I was shocked to see that just outside the kitchen, there was an inflatable toy that I used to have to punch for fun on the studio. It was horrible. I had no idea how it got there. I felt very scared. I didn't know if it was something paranormal or a person entered the house and he was playing us the worst joke ever. My girlfriend asked me what was wrong with me, why I stood at the door. I told her not to leave the kitchen, that I didn't want her to see that, but she leaned out and screamed. I tried to calm her down, nothing had ever happened in that house. We were very scared and at that moment, the bell rang. I answered on the intercom and nothing. Every time I was more nervous, but I tried to stay calm. I walked towards her and the bell rang again. I answered and nothing. I told her, let's get out of here. Something or someone is bothering us. It occurred to me to go to the house of a cousin who lived nearby. And then the light started to blink. It was horrible. Getting to the street was a great relief. And by the way, it was completely desolate. We walked a few blocks until we reached my cousin's house. We told her everything while our hands were still shaking. She believed us and said she had some holy water and that we had to go back because what happened to us was not normal. When we came back with the holy water, you could hear loud music from the street. We opened the door with fear and immediately, my cousin began to sprinkle holy water all over the place. The inflatable toy was in another place. It seemed that it had moved a few meters from where we saw it last time. The knob of the speakers was at maximum and all the lights in the house were on. It seemed that they, and had a small party without us. It was horrible. I was never skeptic to the paranormal, but I didn't believe everything I heard until that night. For my good luck, I can say that after using the holy water, nothing else happened in that house. I no longer live there. I threw the toy and that girlfriend is now my wife and we know that all that was real. These spirits or entities exist and we must be careful, have faith in God, and not let them disturb us. So around 2016, I'd been living in my new house for about a year or two with my mom's now ex-husband and my mom. After a while, it began to feel weird being alone there. And at night, it would feel like I was being watched from my hallway. I would go to sleep with the door open, never once falling asleep, not facing the door. Anyway, after a few months of this, one night while falling asleep with my TV on, I wake in a dream. At this time, my bed was laid on a side in front of a large window, and my door was on an opposite side of the room. So, I think I'm awake, and I notice that on my side, my room is only faintly lit by an orange street lamp. 
And as I turn my head towards the door, something is in my doorway. It looked like the shadow monster from Stranger Things Season 2, but in a more humanoid form. Yes, it looked to be about 8 feet tall, and I could see no eyes. But it felt like the eyes of a predator were on me. It was arched in a way that I felt like I was going to be attacked. I opened my window, jumped out, and ran down to the street. I'm running in jello about half a block down. I feel out of breath. I turn and look. I see my street and a street lamp. I try to run further, but I can't. We turn around again, and I see it standing there under the street lamp. It screams a loud, harmonious, guttural and terrifying scream. One that makes your stomach drop. At that moment, I woke up and my abdomen shot up. I'm gasping for air and crying. My TV was turned off and I was in darkness. I woke up around midnight, I believe, and I stayed up until 3am watching Spongebob or something. I know the TV thing could be explained like automatic turn off or my mom turning it off, but I have reason to believe she didn't do that. I also had AT&T, and usually after a while, it would go to some blue screen instead of turning off. Either way, waking up again in the way dreams started terrified me. After that, I smudged, and I think I told whatever that was to leave me alone. Now that I think about it, I believe I put salt in my bedroom doorway. I don't remember anything happening after that, but my mom and I ended up moving into another haunted place because she got a divorce. If anyone has any idea about what this was, or has seen something similar, I would be interested in hearing. It didn't feel human. So we decided to go somewhere haunted during the day. There's this cemetery in Santa Cruz we decided to check out. We went in and walked around and nothing out of the ordinary happened, so we decided to leave. The cemetery is on a supposed haunted road that leads up into the woods. This road is said to be haunted by a lady in white that tries to hitchhike into your car. I had forgotten this fact until the day after. Alright, so along this road we're driving, down it leads into a forested area. A couple of miles down from the cemetery, you can pull to the side of the road and walk along this hiking trail. So we decided to hike this trail because I completely forgot the road was also haunted, so I wasn't even looking for anything paranormal. Anyways, we start hiking this trail in the afternoon. Ten minutes into the trail, we stumble along abandoned train tracks and a barely standing bridge for the train that used to run along those tracks. It looked cool, so we decided to go down this hill right by the bridge that lets you go under the dilapidated bridge. We go down there and just mess around, looking at the cool architecture. After we had our view, we started back up the little hill that leads back to the trail. When we get to the top, we're a little exhausted because the hill is kind of steep and you have to use the trees around you as leverage to climb back up. So we're standing around back on the trail when we both notice something out of the ordinary. We hear a voice, like a grown man shouting and screaming very angrily. When I say angry, I mean angry. This voice sounded like a rage-filled, hatefully murderous man. We quiet down and I can tell the voice is very far away. Almost sounded like it was in the mountains around us. Sounded more than 500 feet away, that's for sure. We both look at each other like, what the fuck is that? We stand around listening for like 15 seconds and next thing we know, the voice came down the trail from what sounded like hundreds of feet away to being like right down the end of the trail. The inhuman speed the voice came closer to us was unnatural. I noticed the voice coming from down the trail and I'm thinking to myself, this voice sounds like it's someone who's about to kill someone out of rage. But the weird thing is that the voice is speaking what I can only call gibberish. I understood not one word it was saying. I instantly get this fight or flight feeling all in my body because the voice starts getting very loud and closer to us at inhuman speeds. I told my brother to pick up some huge sticks with me to defend ourselves, because even though the voice came out of nowhere and moved down the trail at lightning speeds, I still had the assumption it was some kind of crazy person 
ready to kill someone. We pick up the sticks and run down the trail back to the car. Now here's the weird part. As we're running away from this voice that's coming down the other end of the trail, I hear the voice come up behind us in an instant. It sounded like he was no more than 10 feet behind us, chasing us back to the car. I turn around, even though I don't want to, because I have to see how close the psycho is to us. As I look back and hear the voice right behind me, I see no one. I tell my brother to run faster because the voice is right behind us, yelling in absolute rage, but I see no one chasing us. We started picking up speed, and the craziest thing in my life happened. The voice starts panning around us in 360 audio. I hear the voice yelling in gibberish right behind me. Then it starts panning to my left, through the trees, just off the trail. Then the voice is right in front of us, and it slides to the right side of the trail and then back behind us, all in a matter of 10 seconds. At this point, me and my brother were very creeped out and ran the rest of the trail back to the car. The voice kept following us down the trail. I remember after hearing the voice panning around us and hearing it reverberate around the woods, I started praying to help me come out of here alive. After we make it around halfway down the trail to my car, the voice disappears. I remember slowing down exhausted and we started talking about what we heard. I asked my brother if he also heard the voice slide in circles around us and he said he heard it too. At that point, I knew I wasn't hallucinating or imagining it. I asked my brother if he heard how it sounded like gibberish, but like a man screaming at the top of his lungs in rage. He said he heard the same thing. We finally get into the car and I drive the fuck out of there in a heartbeat. I remember the car ride was silent for like five minutes as we just sat there thinking about what happened. That's when I remember that the whole road was haunted and not just the cemetery. I had been down that trail alone a few months before this experience and had nothing weird happen. That was one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced in my entire life. To this day, I've never been back down that trail and never plan on it either. Everything I've written down is the absolute truth and nothing has been altered. The Santa Cruz area and mountains are known for cults and very dark magic being performed in them. This happened many years ago, I think maybe 2010 or 2011. It was winter break and I was out in the woods camping with three other friends. I've been camping on an almost weekly basis for years and occasionally for my whole life and was very familiar with the whole experience of it. For some reason, I was really complacent this time and didn't prepare very well. It was about zero degrees, well below freezing, and I just have a sweatshirt and a jacket. Walking around, I was doing fine, although my feet were cold, I remember. We found our spot to make camp for the night. We don't use tents or sleeping bags. We built a fire and chatted. I'm growing increasingly miserable as I can't get warm, even with the fire going, especially my feet. I got my feet really close to the fire, boots on, and I can't tell if they're warming up or not. Take the boots off and still can't tell. Can't keep them too close because they'll burn and I'm so cold I won't feel it if they do. I remember being so desperate for warmth, I repeatedly asked my friends if they'd give me anything they have. The only extra piece of gear anyone had is a poncho. I took it, knowing it'll probably do nothing, but I'm really desperate, and I wrapped myself up in it like a blanket. I didn't want to be the reason we have to pack up and go back early on the first night, so I try to just endure this as best as I can. I'm laying there on the ground, so damn cold, and I remember feeling a bit sleepy. I went into it and passed out. After some unknown amount of time, everything from here on was relayed to me later, some large creature comes crashing through the forest, snapping branches and making all kinds of crazy sounds. My friends try to wake me up, but I'm unconscious from the cold and won't wake up. This creature comes up to right behind where I'm laying on the ground, and my friends are yelling at it, and it supposedly is acting very loud and seemingly aggressive. 
shaking trees right behind me, maybe about 15 feet away. This would be a good point to mention, there are no bears or major game in this area, other than deer. Friends and I all grew up in a wooded country area and know the behaviour of deer well. They don't violently break and shake trees with this intensity. The creature has a standoff with my friends for a few minutes and I still won't wake up. They make the decision to escape with their own lives and leave me laying there on the ground. I don't blame them. So what you gotta do? Sometime in less than what I guessed to be 30 minutes after this, I woke up. I felt a strange sense of peace and comfort. Somehow I was warm. Despite hours next to the fire and still descending into hypothermia and temperature continuing to drop, nobody tending the fire, I woke up and was warm. I woke up, as I said, with a feeling of peace. Immediately noticing my friends aren't here with me, I'm unfazed by it and I'm just perfectly content to sit there and exist. After maybe about 10 minutes or so of sitting there awake and warm, I hear my friends coming back. They see from a distance my silhouette sitting next to the fire and run back. They're urgently asking me questions if I'm okay, what happened, etc. Told them I don't know what they're talking about. They relayed this to me and their decision was we're going back home early because of that. Not because of the cold. We all talked about our experiences and were pretty confused by the whole thing. My feet were purple for like two months. I constantly had a slight feeling of being cold and the skin on my feet and legs hurt a lot for a while. Healed up fine, although I think I get cold easier now. Been about 10 years since this happened and everybody is still very curious about it. I'm very convinced it's not a joke. A couple of years ago, I was admitted to the mental hospital for suicide attempts and self-harm. After I had filled out some papers and had everything sorted out for my hospital stay, I was brought into the day room to meet the other patients. I sat down and introduced myself. Then, my eyes landed on one of the girls and I froze. I could have sworn I knew her from somewhere, but it was a weird feeling I got. I had to make myself focus on the other people and conversations or else I would keep thinking about how I knew her. I noticed she looked at me a few times too, like she was trying to figure me out. Later in the meal room, she was staring a hole into me. I noticed, and something was telling me her name was Kelsey. I can't explain it, but I was being told that was her name, and her last name was on the tip of my tongue. Finally, she spoke up and said, do I know you from somewhere? I told her I had been thinking the same thing about her and asked where she was from and what her name was. When she replied Kelsey B, I swear my heart stopped for a second. Even the last name that was on the tip of my tongue. I told her my name and she replied, I know your name from somewhere. I just don't know where from. We spent the next half hour trying to find any possibility of how we could know each other. While we were talking, it felt like I literally knew this girl. However, no family, mutual friends, ac mutual activities or clubs, and she had never been to the area I lived in. But I knew her face and voice and name before she even said it. When I got out of the hospital, I searched for her. Found nothing. For the past few years, every few months I searched for her using every way possible. When I think of her, I get a yearning feeling. My chest and stomach ache. She wasn't supposed to be a long-term patient, so she's still not there. What teenage, now adult girl has no social media? I can't explain it. Do we know each other in a different universe? Do we have connections from our past lives? There's no way this is a coincidence. So two nights ago at about 1.30am, my boyfriend and I were chilling in his car, parked in the driveway in front of the house, for some outside time for a while. From my passenger side view, I'm able to see through the window of the living room diagonally into the kitchen, where the small light above the sink was on. We started talking about video games, so that made us get ready to head back inside. 
Through the window, I saw a dark shadow pass from the kitchen light into the dark living room. I asked my boyfriend if he saw anything, but he missed it. I'm always reading about supernatural things, so I kept moving my head back and forth to try to replicate the same shadow movements I saw to make sure I wasn't just jumping to conclusions and came back with no results. For more detail, it was pretty quick. If it were a person, it would be like I only saw them from their shoulders down by the time I noticed it go into the dark. About then, which was only probably like a minute later, the kitchen lights went out, and my boyfriend saw it too. It's probably my mom who said, Yeah, but isn't it always on? That's weird, I said. So yeah, and we spooked, but whatever. Then, the light turns back on. Again, like a minute later, and there's the same shadow. It was only seconds before it walked away again, but it stood still, and I made out a body and an arm. The whole dark figure had a feminine frame, and looked as if they were dragging their hand while looking out of the window. Now, I'm spooked as fuck. My boyfriend was confused too, but insisted that it was his mom probably not being able to sleep. I get pretty spooked easily, but it was weird actually having real visual evidence. Anyway, we got back inside, and I'm like scanning the room for any evidence of anything and saw nothing. There was absolute silence. My boyfriend's parents were asleep. I was acting so weird. I was so scared, honestly. I was so freaked out, my boyfriend thought I was messing with him. Anyway, I wanted to post this that night, but decided it wasn't that cool, and probably his mom. Until now. So we're all eating, and I hear my boyfriend mention the story above, because he started noticing that he'd go from our guest room to the kitchen to get snacks and drinks, and within like 25 to 50 minute intervals, the light would either on or off, with no sounds of his parents moving. Then, his mom straight up replied, Oh yeah, there was a lady who died in that living room, you know. It's probably her. I kid you not, I froze. Then, I learned that that lady who died was best friends with the neighbour across the street, who's a writer. When the writer would get up at odd hours to do her typing, she would see from her window the shadow of her friend. She literally knocked on their door one night to let them know her friend's ghost was there. So now I'm here. It happened probably when I was about five, I want to say. It was before my family moved states, and we lived in a two-story house in New England. I'd say our house was at least a hundred years old. That doesn't exactly explain the phenomenon I witnessed, but maybe it had been the site of another house at one time, I'm not sure. A little backstory. I was a pretty sensitive kid, and very in tune, especially around this age. My mom told me she'd often be thinking of something like, I want to make chicken for dinner. And then I'd ask her if we could have chicken for dinner. That's sort of funny thing. It seems dumb and silly, but I also think it's a bit telling. Our laundry units were in the basement of this house. My mom never liked going down there much because it was wet and pretty dark. It smelled like earth. One day, she was carrying me down with her to put a load of laundry in the machine. I asked her, and I remember this pretty clearly, who those people in the corner were. She freaked out and asked what I was talking about. I remember I saw two people there, sort of see-through and sort of floating above the ground in the upper corner. One was an adult woman, one was a young boy. They both had buckles on their shoes. I told my mum. Note, I was too young to know about pilgrims or old-fashioned clothing at this age. I didn't learn history in school yet at all. They were wearing odd clothes too. I told my mom. The mom looks angry, but the little boy says it's okay. I remember that. The apparition of the woman did look very unhappy and it scared me. But her son spoke to me and told me it was okay. Anyway, after relaying all this to my mom, she freaked out and we went upstairs fast. I'm not sure what it was. Like I said, I wasn't learning about history at this young age. I didn't watch much TV either because I went to an alternative school. I was always kind of put off by old things and scared of them. 
We lived in a very historically rich town and neighborhood for the War of Independence. I was probably 11 or 12. This happened a long ways down our street. On the corner, there was a two-story greenhouse with a large red gate. We lived in a historical neighborhood in the south. I can't remember if we were driving or walking when I saw what I saw. It happened sort of fast, I think. I looked over and saw a being short and stocky in stature, standing and sort of looking over the metal red gate. They had very large eyes, almost like the movie Big Eyes or the paintings by Margaret Keane. They, whoever they were, also had brown scruffy hair. And I was sad thinking wearing a large t-shirt almost cartoonish, like a drawing. I've always been sensitive and tried to block things out if that makes sense. I didn't want to see anything that wasn't in our world, and I wasn't even sure what I saw that day. If it was just a very, very odd looking person or something else. But it made me shudder and blink to double check what I was there. Ever since I saw something there behind the red gates, whenever we'd pass, I'd feel uncomfortable and pray I didn't see what I saw again, which makes me think it was more than normal. In my house in the early 2000s, I had lots of VHS tapes. I remember watching over and over, but there was only one I only recall putting on twice. And even then, I only briefly saw what it had on it. It was some animation with puppets, which might have been stop motion animated, or the puppets controlled like the way the Muppets are, or with strings like in Thunderbirds, I can't remember. Might have been a mix, but in the few shots burned into my memory of this thing, the puppets looked like they were being controlled like Muppets, but sure as hell weren't as family friendly looking. The first time I put the video in there is the scene of a little boy sleeping in his bed in a dark room. And I remember he probably had red hair and looked somewhat realistic, which was what was scary about this show. I'm from the UK and I used to watch Rosie and Jim. And if you haven't heard of it, look it up. The character Jim is what this boy looked like, except more realistic. The boy's head is only seen lying on the pillow. And then an old man, which I guess is his granddad, is seen talking to him by the bedside. The old man looks kind of like the doctor from Back to the Future, but as a realistic puppet. I remember my dad seeing me watching this and being like, turn this off, whatever this is. Then I put the video in again some other time and saw a different scene. The boy was outside in the daytime in some backyard or alleyway. I don't know if it was some place outside a house door. There was a shot of the boy looking at me and then a shot of the old man standing on his doorstep looking at the boy. And I think there was a dog barking in the background too. Weird, I know. The beard was so spooky, like it had no box or any label identifying it. And I remember finding such a video and putting it in again, hoping it wasn't the scary puppets. And was relieved to see it was Pingu. I remember watching a short film from the early 90s called Tom Thumb, featuring stop motion puppets and real humans, which kind of looked like this thing and might have been some surreal short film made by similar artists. The grainy quality of the show makes me think it must have been made in the 60s to 90s. It's a mystery as to what this video's thing was meant to be, how it ended up in our house, and what became of it. Now for the sake of context to that specific night, I was at home alone with my two dogs. It was late at night, so it was completely dark outside, aside from a dim light shining partially over my neighbor's fence into my yard. It was about 2 a.m. and I was up late, no lifing another Skyrim playthrough. My dogs started to bark a little bit, which usually means they hear or see either a person or animal. So I walked out and looked out the sliding glass door and saw nothing. So I told them to stop and went back to my room. About 10 minutes later, I heard the loudest yelp from my husky ever. For all the husky owners out there, 
You know that Huskies yelping isn't uncommon because they're a very vocal breed, but this was different. In the year and a half that I've had her, I've accidentally stepped on her tail. Stuff has fallen and scared her. She's been bitten by another dog and I've never heard her yelp this loud. I ran out to the living room to see what was going on and her and my German shepherd were laying together under my dining room table, shaking, and she had a small drop of blood on her ear. My dogs never lay with each other. Don't get me wrong, they love each other, but whenever one gets close to the other, it always results in a fight. So they generally will lay separately, unless they want to play. I assumed it was an animal, and considering my neighbourhood borders a forested area, I grabbed my dad's pistol just in case it was a rabbit, because occasionally we'll get rabid raccoons in my town, and I've heard stories about even rabid coyotes. I walked out and turned the light on to look out the window, and for about five seconds I saw nothing, and right when I was about to look away, I heard the gravel crunch, so I looked back out again. I again saw nothing, so I decided since I have a pistol, I'm probably safe to walk out, and right as I reached for the door, a hand came flying towards the part of the glass right next to my face. And what appeared to be a male in his late teens to early twenties stared at me with a blank and expressionless face. Normally I'd assume this was either some lunatic or someone trying to fuck with me, if not for the fact that his eyes were a reflective deep black, almost like obsidian. Also, I don't know if this is cliche or not, but I've never felt such a sense of terror in my entire life. I've been in life-threatening situations before, I've dealt with a home intruder before, I've even been shot at before, and I've never ever felt such a primal and intense sense of terror in my entire life. The shock made me fall over, but when I looked back with the gun trained, he was gone. I was still in a state of shock, so instead of going out there alone, I called my neighbour and he came with a shotgun. We both went out back together and saw nothing. Not the person, not any footprints in the gravel and dirt, no handprints on the window. Literally nothing, so I decided it probably wasn't worth filing a police report. I checked over the security camera footage and saw nothing. I used a fingerprint kit on the glass and found nothing aside from myself and my dad's prints. It's been about four days so far and I haven't seen anything, but I left some cornstarch in the backyard to see if there were any prints there and haven't seen any. This house has been in my family for 60 years now, and there hasn't been any notable incidents that would leave me believe that a spirit has a reason to haunt my house, considering they do exist. My grandfather bought this house directly after it was built, so he would probably know if anything happened. As far as the area, it's a relatively peaceful community, and as far as accidents or murders, there aren't any that I've been linked to, and none have happened in my area. Again, I'm an extremely sceptical person, so I'd like to believe that this was just someone messing with me, but I didn't recognise the person, and I don't know how a person could achieve making their eyes look like that aside from contact lenses, but I feel like if someone scared me with contact lenses, I'd probably know them, and everyone that knows me understands that they would get shot or bit by dogs if they pulled some shit like that. Again, I'm on bad terms with the local church, and I don't know anyone from any other churches, so I'm reluctant to look there for help. The only reason I can think of that it may be something that isn't human is my ex was borderline obsessed with the occult. And when she cheated on me, I broke up with her and grilled her for a few hours. So I guess it's possible that she did something to my house. I don't know. We've been broken up for over a year now and I haven't seen her since then. To understand the story better, you need to know what a Tao Tao Mona is. It's a term from my people's native language, Chamorro from Guan, that best translates as forefathers, but it has a broader meaning than that. Our culture, before the introduction of Catholicism by the Spanish conquistadors, practiced spiritual worship, veneration of deceased ancestors. The Tao Tao Mona, who were believed to play an active role in our daily lives, This belief and the inspired traditions are still prevalent in our culture today. 
You'd also need to know what a latte stone is. Latte stones are a stone sculpture consisting of a tapering, ascending foundation with a bowl-shaped stone placed on top, but not hollowed out. These were used to elevate huts by our ancestors, and as grave markers as well. Some are as small as 3 feet tall, and others up to 15 feet high. I live in a modern development at the top of a hill called Latte Heights as an adolescent. It's called Latte Heights because there is an authentic ancient Latte Stone Park at one end, with several Latte Stones carved and placed by our ancestors. These were not disturbed by the developers of the housing track. There's a park on the opposite end of the development, about three quarters of a mile away, and a parkway that connects the two that runs through the entire Latte Heights development. Along the parkway, where it intersects with streets, are the bus stops where we caught the buses to school. When I was in my teens, the bus stops were made of wood and were essentially an eight foot square wooden box lined with benches on the inside and an opening facing the street. One night, my friend and I were smoking a cigarette in a bus stop from which the backside had been kicked out. We were just chilling, talking shit as teens do, when the bushes and tall grasses across the street started rustling, quite violently, much as if a bear were in them, and of course, there were no bears in Guam. So we were just laughing and saying it was the Tautamona, but were only mildly spooked by it. We continued to smoke and kind of joke about the Tautamona in the bushes. Suddenly, then, the bushes behind us started rustling violently in the same fashion. We were completely freaked out, because nothing had crossed the street, nor was there any pause in the activity across the street and the rustling behind us. The transition was instantaneous. One moment it was across the street, next it was behind us. Naturally, we leapt out of the bus stop. My heart was tearing out of my chest and I'm sure my friends was too. We commented to one another that this was indeed a Tautamona. So we decided to finish our cigarettes in the path between two of our friends' houses, which were just a few yards away from that bus stop. Why didn't we run? Well, Tautamonas aren't exactly feared. Their role to the living is like that of a respected elder. You only fear them if you've done something really bad. Anyway, no sooner had we taken a puff when the figure of a young woman emerged from behind the house on the right and floated the distance to and behind the house on the left. We were stunned and paralysed. She had no legs, just a white, cloud, dense but opaque figure, clearly female from head to about mid-thigh. She didn't walk, she floated exceptionally smoothly over an uneven path. When we gathered the courage, we followed the figure, which had disappeared, despite the tall cinder block fence obstructing the path. There was absolutely nowhere for a living person to hide. The only explanation for me was it was not a person, but a spirit. I'll never forget that experience. It was a long time ago, but still as vivid as today, as it was when it happened. I don't think she was trying to scare us or at least not terrorise us. She may have been doing her duty as a Tautamona to reprimand us for being out late, smoking cigarettes and using profanity. She may have just been playful, perhaps just entertaining herself and us all at the same time. This is how my parents have always told this story to me. I was three at the time, so I really don't remember it at all, personally. But this is the story they say I told them. My mom says one night in the middle of the night, I came bursting into her room, hysterically telling them to get the lady with a hole in her stomach out of my room. My parents, obviously perplexed, went into my room and checked it out. They found nothing, except my dad said my room was freezing. It was the middle of the summer, and we didn't have air conditioning, so it was weird. My parents, assuming it was a nightmare, asked me to describe the woman to them. They said my description was incredibly vivid, that I described her hair and her face, what she was wearing, and very specific birthmarks she had. My mom said my dad's face after the explanation went pale, and he just walked outside. My mom, once she got me to calm down, put me to sleep, 
and went outside to talk to my dad. My dad broke down once she went outside and told her the story of his first girlfriend, the only other girl he had dated seriously besides my mom. My dad's first girlfriend killed herself by shooting herself in the stomach. He was so freaked out because I had described her to a T, even mentioning her very specific birthmarks. My mum had never heard about her before this point, as my dad didn't like to talk about it. She, his ex-girlfriend, called him the morning before she killed herself, and he didn't catch her call because he was out surfing with his friends. My mum has speculation on why she chose to haunt me. She thinks she had to tell my dad something. There are speculations on what that something is. Also, it's highly speculated among her friends, and my dad believes it too, that she didn't commit suicide, but was murdered by her current boyfriend at the time. My dad and her were already broken up by the time she committed suicide. It was last summer. My girlfriend, now wife, and I finally made the big decision to move in together. Cobblestone Square is a location of apartment complex surrounding a centre park. After living in another apartment for two years, I learned a bigger apartment was opening up on the other side of the complex. We needed a bigger space because my wife had two children from a previous marriage. After a rushed inspection, we were happy to move in as June started. The months passed by and the days grew shorter and colder. Autumn was drawing close and with it, that's when the trouble began. In all the stories and movies, it starts out small. Things moving from place to place, lights being left on, etc. All chalked up to forgetfulness. This was true in our case and we didn't think much of it. It only started to escalate with the children. Our apartment is set up with two bedrooms and a bath on the opposite end of each other. In our bedroom, we have our own private bathroom and next to the kids room is a small hallway leading to their own bathroom. We would give them baths here and potty train and almost as if flicking a switch. When the autumn months came, our youngest, a two year old girl, would absolutely hate going in that bathroom. At the mere mention of bath time, she would go into hysterics or on good days, she would sit in the tub and in the process of bathing, she would look past myself or my wife and start screaming and crying. Oftentimes something would catch her eye in the mirror and she would also start crying like mad. The most unsettling part would be that as soon as we took her out of the bathroom, she would stop and act like nothing happened. Our son, who was four at the time, also would run up to us and say that he would hear a voice saying, Uppy, which is a common saying among children when they wanted to be held. We asked if it was his sister and he would profusely say it wasn't her, but he did say it sounded like a kid. This happened a few times. With my wife being separated from her first husband and split in custody, we would have the children come live with us every other week. On the weeks that the children would go stay with their dad, the activity would seem to die down, but that didn't mean it wouldn't happen. I asked my wife what she remembered from last year, and she recounted a time when we didn't have the children, and she was cleaning the house. She noticed the kids' door was open. We usually keep it closed, but thought that maybe I went into their room for something. Checking to see if I was inside and seeing I wasn't, she closed the door and didn't think much of it. It wasn't until a while later that she went to use the kids' bathroom and saw that the door was open again. She found me in our room and asked if I had opened it. I said I didn't. With more incidents of lights being found on and doors opening, it all came to a head near the end of October when I was washing dishes in the kitchen. Above the sink, facing the living room, is a small window that allows someone in the kitchen to look out into the dining room and living room, and additionally, the back door, which is a sliding glass door. Important detail. After the kids had been put to bed and were asleep, my wife and I set about our nightly duties of chores to finish before the next day started. As I was washing dishes, I looked up from the sink and saw in the glass of the sliding glass door, a reflection of a large shadow in the hallway to the kids' bathroom. It quickly entered the bathroom and I immediately walked over, turning on the light and seeing nothing there. 
I went to my bedroom where my wife was vacuuming, and I asked her if she by chance went into the kids' bathroom for whatever reason. I wasn't surprised by her response when she said no, and I told her what I saw. It was after this event, and subsequently Halloween, that all the activity seemed to stop. Months passed by again, and jumped to 2020, August. As soon as the activity started again, I started to keep a journal of all the findings. That way there was a record. On August 10th, I went out to go to the bathroom in the kids' bathroom before going to bed and heard a small child giggle. Both children were fast asleep. August 11th, my wife was bathing our daughter and for the first time in a year, our little girl started to shriek in fear unless she was out of the bathroom. August 13th, while getting ready for bed, our son knocked on our door. I'm always the one to answer and he told me that he was afraid. He wouldn't elaborate on what, but when I laid him down in his bed, he begged for the closet door to be closed. The closet was never been a problem, and a few nights after this, we returned to it being open, and haven't experienced something like this again. August 15th, my wife and I had an argument, and I went out to the couch to sleep for the night. As I was tossing and turning, I heard a child's voice in the night say, "Uh huh," as if answering a question. I forced myself to go to sleep. Both myself and my wife have caught our son speaking to himself as well. My wife told me that once she heard him saying, Ow, stop it, you're hurting me. And when she went to go check on him, he was in the hallway by the kid's bathroom, holding his arm. During the daytime, the kids were playing, and both me and my wife were doing our own thing. As I was sitting on the couch, our son ran behind the couch, stopped and then said, And how would you do that? Out of the blue. I turn to him and ask him who he's talking to, and after a moment's hesitation, he says nobody. I told him I heard him say something, and then he insisted he didn't say anything. One occasion, my wife was sleeping on the couch, and in the middle of the night, heard a man's whisper say, Don't get up, to which she promptly obeyed. It was the night after I woke up from my sleep in bed, to see a shadow shape standing over me with piercing red eyes. I felt as if it was going to hurt me. My wife and I have naturally begun our interest in the spiritual world. We began researching and looking for ways to go about this. We've purchased a Ouija board and with no results from a medium, a supposedly haunted ring. If our apartment was going to be haunted, we wanted to know by who and with what intentions. It seems as if our mail order ghost has already made their home as one morning our front door was unlocked and slightly ajar. Nothing stolen. Tonight as I write this, my wife and I were watching TV on the couch and decided to call it a night. But as we went to our bedroom, I noticed a low scratching sound coming from the record player. I opened it up and saw the turntable was moving as the needle was off its holder, turning the record player on. I replaced the needle and tried knocking the player a few times to see if it could have been easily bumped and knocked off. But no. The only way to move that needle was to pick it up with your fingers and set it down. I was reminded of one other time that this happened long before we bought any haunted items. I'm thoroughly convinced my apartment is haunted. People die in them way too often to think about it not a possibility. And if nobody died here... The cemetery across the road definitely doesn't bring me any comfort. As I write this, I can say that two distinct entities can be somewhat accounted for. A small child ghost and something else. Or maybe something that wants to be viewed as a child, but let's think happy thoughts. We still live here to this day, and if any new events happen, I can be sure to update you. Autumn is just beginning, and that's when things seem to really get interesting around here. So this summer, my elderly grandma got dramatically less healthy and began living with my parents. My parents have a den in the front of the house in a staircase that begins off the same foyer. Anyway, they tried to make grandma as comfortable as possible for the last few months of her life. They moved a TV in there, a few of her things from home, and my sister got a brand new Echo Show to display the time and weather. Sadly, 
Grandma began to show signs that she was nearing the end. I came back home to see her for a few days before she passed. While it was definitely uneasy watching a loved one pass, it didn't seem creepy or unnerving. Everything seemed normal. The echo in the corner, her in her bed, and visitors coming and going. About a week later, she passed in her room. And that evening I went back into that room, and the Amazon Echo loudly yelled out the time. It had never done that before. Scared me to death. I continued to sit in the den and play the piano there. Then suddenly again, it happened. I ran out of there and asked my mum if she'd heard it in the next room. She had, but didn't think much of it. I think it's just a random tech thing. Fast forward to tonight, we're back visiting for Labour Day weekend. And as I'm carrying things up the staircase across the foyer, it yelled out the time again. I threw my suitcase. Then, as I gathered myself, it did it again. I ran upstairs and this time my fiancé heard it. I know I'm not crazy, and this happened multiple times. I've googled, can Echo talk without prompt? Amazon proximity telling time. Motion sense talking, etc. There's no TV on, and it's silent except for the AC running. My fiancé said it's her saying hi to me or something, but I don't buy that. There's got to be a rational reason why this is happening. This happened to me in June 2019. I had turned 17 a month earlier, and I was mentoring a group at a summer camp. The events of this story take place in Angela, southern Finland. There's an old manor in the school centre, where the camp was held. The manor is really beautiful, built in the 17th century, I guess. Very much ghost house material. It's surrounded by a forest and there are two roads that lead to the front yard. The manor is open for visitors and for that one week, our camp instructors had a key to the back door. There was another summer camp at the same time with us because the school centre was so big and we shared the key with them. We spent time in the mansion almost every evening, doing activities such as singing and playing. One night, when I was going to bed, I realised that I had forgotten my phone inside the manor. It was necessary for me to get it back. I had woken up alarms and I had to call home, so I went to the camp instructor's flat to get the keys. Unfortunately, they had given the keys to the other camp's night watch and I had to find her. Because the school centre was quite large and I had no flashlight, it took me a while to find her. While giving me the keys, the night watch told me she had seen some movement in the edge of the field. The school centre was surrounded by fields and forests, and the edge of the field was where the forest began and where the manor was located. I noted that, but I didn't think of it that much when time passed. It took me five minutes to get to the manor. The front yard was dark because it was sometime between 11pm and 12am. I went straight to the back of the manor. I think one important thing to note is the fact that the backyard was wide. There were no trees, only grass, so I was fully visible when searching the back door. The only door I found was the one that I had been using during the evening activities, but that door could only be opened from the inside. The whole time, I had felt kind of strange, probably because of what the night watcher told me. But standing alone on the veranda at night in the back of an empty mansion, I suddenly had a feeling that someone was watching me. Because I'm young and have no chill, and I didn't even know where the right door was, I decided to go to the building where I stayed with other mentors, and then have my friend go back to the manor with me. I left the manor without looking back because the atmosphere was disturbing. My friend was still awake, so I asked her to come with me to get my phone. On our way to the manor, she told me that the right back door was actually a side door, and it was located in the edge of the forest. We hadn't even arrived at the front yard of the manor when we saw it. Three figures moving fast from the back of the manor all the way across the front yard and then disappearing to the forest. We just stood there and held our breath. Those guys obviously hadn't seen us because they just vanished. Me and my friend waited for them to come back, but because they didn't show up, we continued our way to the manor. 
After this, we spent like 15 minutes inside the building, but my phone wasn't there. So we left and gave the keys back to the night watch. We also told her what we had seen, and she called the guards, but they didn't find anyone. I did find my phone. It was under a couch in the building I stayed in. I don't know what I saw that night. It all happened so fast. But I think the figures in the forest were waiting for someone to show up and open the manor doors so they could go in. When I arrived there alone, they probably thought that that was their time. But since I couldn't open the door and left, they must have thought that I was just checking the locks or something, and then they left. All I can think about now is what could have happened if I had managed to open the doors at first try. The manor is huge, and it's far from any other building on that site. This happened in late 2020. I live in a two bedroom, a hall and a kitchen apartment in a group of apartment buildings arranged in a rectangle with all buildings connected to each other by a common terrace. Our apartment is on the fifth floor, the top floor of one of those buildings. Both the bedrooms have a balcony attached to it, separated by a door. Balconies of all apartments face inside the rectangle formed by the buildings. It remained surprisingly quiet, even though the buildings were in a pretty busy part of the city. Both balconies have a clothesline running on its outer side. We keep a small bucket full of cloth pegs and clips. We keep this bucket in one of the balconies. It's usually left in one where we last dried some clothes. We even stored wire nets in both balconies to stop pigeons from entering, as there are many pigeons in the area. They usually destroy plants and sometimes hurt themselves with stuff lying around on balconies. Note that after installing those nets, we never had an incident of a pigeon entering the balcony again, as those nets were tightly fitted with no gaps large enough for any pigeon to enter. Until that day. I live with my parents. Me and my mum were the only people in our apartment. Dad leaves for work early in the morning. My mom was doing daily chores. I was doing some freelance coding working at the time. So I had my laptop on the study table in my room and I was working on it, on a client's project. The bucket of peg slash clips was on the balcony attached to my room. I knew this because I saw it earlier in the morning when I went to the balcony. Early in the morning, mom had hung some clothes to dry on my balcony. So the bucket had some pegs left in it. Sometime before noon, I suddenly started hearing the sound of clothes pegs being dropped on the floor, one by one on the balcony, at a weirdly constant tempo. At first, I thought that it was my mom taking dried clothes off the clothesline. She had the habit of just throwing the pegs on the floor instead of aiming for the bucket, when in a hurry. But when she came to my room after she heard the sounds as well, I realised it was something else. Maybe a pigeon might have managed to get through the net. So we both headed towards the balcony door, and as soon as we turned the doorknob, the sound stopped. We very much expected to see a pigeon flapping around, trying to find the gap again. But as we opened the door, we saw there was nothing in the balcony. Just pegs scattered on the floor, and a few left inside the bucket. No pigeon or anything else. Not even the sound of a pigeon flapping and flying away. Just complete silence. My mom said it must be a pigeon, but honestly, I don't know if it was. Firstly, there's no way a pigeon can get past the nets. Also, the level at which the pegs were in the bucket was very low. It would be very hard for a pigeon to reach that deep in a bucket while sitting on the edge. And if it was inside the bucket, it would be impossible for it to fly away silently without us noticing it in the time it did. It should have made at least some noise from flapping its wings or from its paws against the plastic bucket and pegs. If we consider that it was indeed a pigeon, then from the moment we installed the nets in balconies till now, that was the only time a pigeon managed to get past the net, and also managed to leave without us seeing it. Some backstory. In 1980, my mum was heading to a basketball game with her two friends. 
her friend Dawn was driving, 16 years old, and missed a turn on an old Montana road during the night and went into the fields. Seatbelts weren't really a thing. Dawn died on impact. My mom was in the middle seat and she went flying through the windshield. The other girl took the least of the crash and was able to walk to a farmhouse and get help. My mom doesn't remember being ejected. Before this year, she told me about the story before, but just the bare minimum that her friend had died in an accident. This year, I asked her more about it because I've always been drawn to Dawn. She mentioned that after the accident, she was put on antidepressants. She experienced glowing orbs flying around her room within the first few weeks after the accident. Since then, she's been terrified of antidepressants. I think the orb was her friend telling her it was okay and she was safe and not to be sad. Months after learning about the incident, just this week, I found a yearbook from the year she died. It was the first time I learned her full name and saw her face. Today, I heard a carpenter's song and immediately wanted to paint. The image in my head was a golden field with a road and canyons in the background. I was listening to 70s music and then dawn came into my head. The next song was Driver's Seat Sniffing the Tears. The lyrics reminded me that dawn was driving, so I checked to see the song name and noticed the time was 1111, an angel number. The song mentions a Saturday night drive and blue news. So out of curiosity, I checked to see what night the crash was on. It was a Saturday night. Then the next song that played was Saturday Night, Bay City Rollers. The playlist is a random shuffle Spotify playlist called 70s Hits that I've never played before. I feel immensely sad for her and I found out that I have a guardian angel three years ago. I didn't know who it could have, but now I believe it to be her. When I was in my early 20s, my parents bought a new house, two hours away from where I lived. It was a two-storey home near the ocean, with the bedrooms upstairs and the living areas downstairs. After they had settled in, I went to visit them and stayed the night in the spare bedroom. Everything seemed normal when I went to bed, and sleeping somewhere new has never bothered me, so I fell asleep easily. I woke up during the night and heard someone walking around upstairs. The floors were timber, so I could clearly hear footsteps walking down the hall and around the stairwell. I checked my phone. It was 3am. I assumed one of my parents had gotten up to get a drink, so I thought nothing of it. Minutes passed, and the footsteps continued. After 10 minutes, I got up to see what was happening. Neither of my parents were sleepwalkers, so I wondered if something was wrong. I opened the door to a pitch black hallway. I stood there for a moment and could no longer hear footsteps. I went to look in my parents' room as their bedroom door down the hall was ajar. Both my parents were asleep in bed. I assumed whichever of them had got up had gone back to bed as soon as I opened the spare room door. So I went back to bed and thought nothing of it. I had trouble falling back asleep. I had laid in bed feeling like something was off. I told myself that timber floors creak all the time, so it was probably just in my head that it sounded like footsteps. As I started to close my eyes, I heard it again. The creaking of footsteps on the upstairs timber floors. I went cold. I told myself one of my parents was awake. That was all. Just go back to sleep. But I couldn't. I heard one of them slowly walk down the hall and to the stairwell. This time... The footsteps were much louder, like they were stomping. I got up immediately, willing myself to open the door to check, to prove to my overactive imagination that this was just one of my parents going to get something. I opened the spare room door and the stomping abruptly stopped. Once again, I stared into the pitch black hallway, although this time I had a gut-wrenching feeling something was staring back at me. It made me feel cold inside. I turned on the bedroom light, illuminating the hallway. It was empty. 
I went to my parents' room, and again they were both still asleep. I went to the stairwell and couldn't see anyone, so I started walking back to where the spare room when I heard the footsteps now downstairs. I froze, thinking someone had broken into the house. I ran back to the spare room to get my phone to call the police if the footsteps continued. As I entered the spare room and closed the door behind me, I instantly heard loud thumping footsteps upstairs, hastily moving towards the spare room door. I was paralyzed with fear. The footsteps stopped right outside the spare room door. My whole body was cold. Whoever was in the house was now standing directly outside the spare room, inches away from where I stood on the other side of the door. I stood there for what felt like hours, but I finally got up the nerve to open the door. I held my hand on the door handle and told myself as a logical explanation that I don't know the sounds this new house makes, that it would make no sense for there to be a person standing in the hallway waiting at my door and that I was safe. But I didn't feel safe. I turned the door handle and looked out into a completely empty, dark hallway. I took a deep breath, closed the door and listened. Nothing. No footsteps. I turned the bedroom light off, got into bed and sat staring at the door until sunrise. No matter how many times I told myself I'm safe, I was still too petrified to sleep or move. No more footsteps. Light finally started filling in through the bedroom window. It was morning. When I finally could hear my parents stir, I went out to talk to them about what had happened during the night, expecting them to tell me it's just a creaky house, or to laugh at how silly I was to be scared. But that's not what happened. When I explained to my mum what I heard, she replied, Oh, that's the man who used to live here. He walks around sometimes. I looked at her in shock and disbelief. I yelled back, What the hell do you mean? Like he still has a key and comes into the house? That's insane. Mum, why haven't you told someone? Called the police. To which my mum replied very casually, No, honey, he died here. He was leaving for vacation with his wife one day. They had packed their bags and the taxi had just arrived out the front. He picked up the bags, walked to the stairwell and tripped on the top flight of stairs. He broke his neck falling down the stairs and died instantly. The real estate had to close it to us when we bought the house. What they didn't tell us is that he still walks around at night. I stood there staring at my mother, trying to fathom what she had just said and how calmly she had said it. She continued, don't worry, he won't hurt you. We usually hear him walking to the stairwell, leaving the house for his holiday. Safe to say, I never stayed at my parents' new house again. So let's kick it back to around six years ago, and I'm around 11 years old. I sleep with my door closed to my room all the time, because I don't like my dog jumping on my bed at midnight, scaring the daylight out of me, no matter how much I love her. But that month, my door would begin rattling as I laid in bed. Like something was trying to grab onto the knob or push the door open, but just wasn't strong enough or able to get a good enough grip on it. And it would make my door just kind of rattle back and forth. It would go on for a short bit, but it would eventually subside after a max of probably two minutes of rattling. Leaving me sitting there thinking, what the hell? I'm trying to force myself back to sleep. This was going on for several nights in a row. I bet there were more happenings that I'd managed to sleep through, but I always remembered waking up to the noise and just staring at the door as it did its thing. So, I eventually got sick of all this nonsense, and suspect it's my dog leaning and pressing against my door, trying to get in. I decided it was better to know it's her than be in fear, wondering, and that I was losing sleep. I still get chills just thinking about this, and this story is the biggest reason I still sleep with a nightlight and believe in ghosts. So that night, it's pretty standard bedtime procedure. Brush teeth, make bed, crawl in, nighty night, and I sleep for a few good hours before I suddenly wake up to a voice whispering in the night. Some real cryptic horror movie bullshit. Kind of like the whispering at the end of the Gravity Falls theme song. 
I just kind of sit there listening to it and start to look around the room and then towards my open door. There he is, standing there in the doorway, a shadow, a silhouette of a very tall man standing there in the doorway that was darker than the darkness around him. Very easy to distinguish just standing outside my room. I, having no idea what's going on, just ask, Dad? And it stops. Dead fucking silence for a good three seconds as me and it are staring each other down. Then it leaves, it slides out of the doorway to the left in a fluidness that isn't natural in any way, shape or form. And like that, it's gone. It's 3am. Dead silence. Just me, my bed and the night. Still scares the shit out of me to this day. I grew up in a pretty old house. It was about 115 years old at the time. It was a two-story Victorian in Minnesota, with a dirt basement that my parents had renovated before I was born. My dad was always a skeptic when it came to ghosts, but while he would stay late renovating it, he would get the overwhelming feeling of being watched. One night while installing new kitchen cabinets, he felt eyes on him again and decided he'd had enough and said loudly, you're going to like it when it's finished. Immediately, he felt calm and didn't have that terrible feeling after that. Once my parents moved into the house, whatever it was seemed to stick around, sometimes causing unexplained noises and such. My mom, being the curious person she is, looked into the history of the house and found a lady named Corin had died in the house. Also, according to rumours, Karen had been known in the neighbourhood Cat Lady, and took in all of the stray cats, and her cause of death was cat scratch fever. I have since done my own research, and have found no proof of this. After learning this information, my mum and dad started to, somewhat jokingly, call this ghost Corin, assuming she was the one haunting it. One day, my dad was watching football, and had the TV on very loud. My mum yelled jokingly, Turn that TV down, or Corin will get you. My dad laughed and said, she can't do anything. And at that moment, the TV turned off and there was a knock at the door. My dad was stunned and jumped up to open the door, but nobody was there. Keep in mind, the front door is right next to the TV in the living room and the huge wraparound porch is also a good six feet off the ground. Whoever knocked would have had to go down steps and down the driveway, all of which you can see from the door basically making it impossible. Right as my dad, confused, shut the door, the TV came back on. My mom said he silently walked over to the couch, sat down, and lowered the volume. When I was a little bit older, my grandparents moved into the downstairs bedroom. One night, my grandmother woke up to someone touching her foot. She looked up to see a woman dressed in a white nightgown, walking away from the bed going out the door and up the stairs, while the rest of the family was still sleeping. My whole family thinks this was Corin. Another experience happened to me when I was five, but it wasn't the cat lady. Instead, I woke up to a man standing in my doorway. I stared at him for a second, and I was so terrified, I couldn't speak. He looked like he had a bell in his hand, but I still don't know for sure. It was really weird. I called for my dad finally, and I watched him run into my room and go right through the intruder. I never saw that ghost again, and there wasn't a whole lot of notable activity from the cat lady other than knocks, footsteps, and other boring stuff. We moved out of that house when I was about six, so I don't have any recent stories. However, in 2011, my family moved to Maryland, where my parents' families are. One night, we spent the night at my uncle's house. His house is pretty old, but he also collects antiques, so there's always a creepy feeling to it. Not bad, not good, just creepy. My parents were sleeping in the guest bedroom upstairs while my sister, who was 11 at the time, and I had to sleep in the living room downstairs. From the living room, we could see the bottom of the stairs and across to the library, which always had a creepy vibe. 
and right around the corner was the kitchen. It was around midnight and my sister and I were half awake, when suddenly we heard noises in the kitchen. This person was moving pots around, opening cabinets and drawers, walking around as if they were making a three-course dinner. But there was one problem. The lights were off everywhere in the house. We would have seen the lights in the kitchen if they were on. We would have heard someone coming down the stairs, but it was completely dark. I whispered to my sister, do you hear that? And she just said softly, yes. And that was it. We both just kind of tried to sleep as if nothing happened. I really don't know why we both did that. Thinking back on it is really terrifying. It went on for a good 20 minutes of cabinets opening and closing, pots and pans rattling, and footsteps moving around. It stopped eventually, and we slept through the night without any more events. In the morning, I woke my sister up and asked her if she remembered anything. She said she did, and relayed the events. I had to make sure it wasn't a dream. And we still both remember this happening. My grandmother lived with my uncle for a bit after my grandfather died, and she would constantly hear footsteps going up and down the stairs and noises in the kitchen. So it's a pretty active house. Jump to 2013, my parents got divorced, so I lived with my mom most of the time. She rented a townhouse that was fairly new. Nothing creepy about it. But I could feel an energy in my bedroom. It wasn't evil. I could just tell something was there. One morning, around 5am, I woke up and saw a shadow of a man standing over me. He had a top hat on and I could tell he was staring at me. I blinked a couple of times and he was still there. I covered my face with a blanket and waited a while. When I peeked out again, he wasn't there. I got out of bed and ran to my mom's room. I told her what I had seen and she didn't even look surprised. She said that the owner of the house's sick husband had died in my room. She hadn't told me because she didn't want to freak me or my sister out, who I shared the room with. My sister never saw anything in that room and that was the only time I saw him. I still don't know what the top hat was about. So yeah, those are the most exciting stories in my family. Others include my other uncle's house being haunted by the KIA US soldier that grew up there. And my other uncle, I have three, and they all have haunted houses, whose ghost liked to sing to my cousin when she was a baby and drag furniture across the floor. I was raised and live in a portion of Tennessee that's still relatively rural by an old farming family of whom 99% of the family was Southern Baptist and all attended the same church and had for generations. This was a multi-room picturesque white church smack on a bend in a road miles away from anything other than farms and sporadic houses. The church has occupied that property for 150 years now and that building had burnt down once around 130 years previously. My mother was not religious and didn't go, so my aunt and uncle were determined to make me into a good little southern Christian. It clearly didn't work, but I digress. My aunt was the kitchen lady, in charge of dinners, breakfasts, that sort of thing. So more often than not, my uncle would drop us off with supplies to cook and prepare the dining room extremely early on Sunday mornings, where we would be having a meal after the service. I'm talking 5-6am early. He'd unlock the side door, take the key with him, and leave to get a few more hours of sleep while we worked. My first experience was around eight years old, and it happened when my aunt told me to go turn on all the lights in the building, and unlock the doors for other congregations to start coming in. The dining room was connected to the rest of the church by a long hallway, which had two Sunday school rooms, two bathrooms, and two entries into the back of the main worship room, as an H junction with a tiny library slash storage room on the left entry and a set of stairs to the baptismal on the right entry. The light of the baptismal was the small series of stairs to get inside the pool itself and I climbed two of those steps and reached around for the light switch and felt a hand grab my own. 
Like anyone would, I freaked out. Fell backwards off the stairs and booked it back to the kitchen where I was chastised for making up a story as I tried to explain the scream and running. That church would try to put in security systems and whatnot, but they never worked right and every security company would refuse to work with them after a while due to electrical issues. As time went on, I had quite a few more experiences in that building, and now as an adult of 27, I ran that property as well. A shadow figure, roughly seven foot tall, staring me down in the hallway one night, after helping clean up from a wedding when I was 10. I would see that figure quite a few more times before I stopped attending. Hair pulled repeatedly, throughout that hallway at various ages, until I chopped it off completely at 15. A face of an angry old and wrinkled man staring at myself and three more girls from the baptismal pool itself. All three promptly never walked in the connecting area again. Had doors slammed from various parts of the building, most often the double doors connecting the vestibule to the main worship room. Saw bright red orb-like lights swinging around in the hallway and windows. I've since seen those lights in the fields around that church when driving home at night in bunches of tennis. Heard murmuring often enough, I tuned it out until someone else would ask if I heard someone talking. Constantly felt like I was being watched by someone who would love to throttle me and felt breathing on my neck practically every time I set foot in there. That church was abandoned a few years ago because of some drama that caused the place to shut down. They've tried to sell the building, but nobody ever wants it for long before they pack up and leave with no warning whatsoever. I feel like whatever's in there is happiest when left alone. And I'm very grateful I don't have to deal with that mess anymore. In the fall of 98, I started college, 18 years old and fresh to the real world. I had a few night classes that I had taken because they were offered in my hometown. I had to travel to take my other classes. It saved me a little money to do it. One of my teachers I didn't vibe with at all and decided I was going to skip her class and go on a road trip with my friends one night. When I say road trip, I mean drive around and smoke weed all evening. We were veteran tokers at this point, so no BS or getting sick or scared, and we weren't the type to overdo it with anything. We lived in a small town, and there wasn't anything to do. Now, I don't condone driving while intoxicated of any type. We were young and dumb at the time, but just imagine a place with a few gas stations and a few crappy fast food places. A stop in the middle of nowhere off an interstate you've never been down, with plenty of roads surrounding it, that aren't travelled a lot. Just a lot of old country roads. Perfect for not being seen. So after several hours of young guys driving around the back roads, smoking joints and telling lies, we decided to get something to eat and call it a night. We were in good shape as far as how high we were. The driver had only taken a few tokes when we first started out on this adventure. We're getting closer to town and there was only one more huge turn. It's like one of those kiss your ass turns before the driving got easier. You have to slow down to come through this one cleanly. Just as we're approaching, an early 90s model Chevy S10 type truck comes bouncing through this huge curve. This thing is going so fast it looks like a rock skipping on water sideways. My friends and I are in a Chevy Monte Carlo. I'm in the back sitting in the middle, so I have a very clear view of this. The last thing I remember seeing is the truck in our lane and our bumper inches from each other. My friend that was driving had nowhere to go off the road to the right. It was about a 20 to 25 foot drop into a field. The angle the truck was coming at us, turning left, may have put us in this path still. A huge hillside almost straight up that met the left side of the road. The turn broke around this hillside. This was one of those life flashes before your eyes type moments. I could see the ambulance arriving in my head in that second. This was not going to be good. I felt the heat coming off the headlights in my face. I closed my eyes and braced myself for impact. 
I heard my friend scream, and then nothing. Complete silence. We were all inaudible, trying to communicate, but too shook up to get the words out. Gibberish and a bunch of loud dude and on dude what the fuck. The car was stopped. We got out to look for this truck that had to have gone off the road to the right of us. From the direction we had come was straight behind us. We could see a car travelling that way. The truck hadn't passed us and went that way. On the left side of the road was a hillside almost straight up and not getting up there. We don't see any headlights off the right side of the road. Being where we live, people used to keep handheld spotlights in our cars and trucks to see where deer were bedding down at night. There's nothing off the road to the right. These spotlights can light up several acres at a time and nothing. No markings on the hillside to the left. No car parts strung across the road anywhere. There isn't a place to turn off for a while behind us. Just a straight road for about half a mile before it starts winding again. It's several minutes before you could turn off into the next holler. So we get back in the car and go as fast as we can, driving to catch up with this truck. At this point, it's for our own sanity to find where it went. We travelled to the end of that road and never saw another vehicle. No one passed us or us catching up to the truck. There were several small houses we passed and no truck in the driveway. We turned up the only holler on the road, two small houses and no truck in the driveway. We came to the conclusion that as crazy as it sounds, it was either a ghost truck or some sort of divine intervention. Because this truck went through us and disappeared. There's no way that it missed us. My friend in the passenger seat claims to this day his eyes were open the whole time and says it disappeared right after we should have felt the impact. I work at a nursing home in Corpus Christi, Texas. It's a higher end one and it's probably the most expensive one around. I started working there almost a year ago. Since I've started here, I've heard many stories about the little boy. Residents, mostly on one side of the building, report having interactions with a little boy. The problem is, this little boy, to the best of our knowledge, is a ghost. At first, I didn't believe the stories. I believe in ghosts, but don't automatically believe every ghost story I've ever been told. The stories I heard were always the same. The kid shows up and is loud, sometimes there's a girl with him, sometimes there's a mom involved, but his dad is never around. Sometimes the mom abandons him. My girlfriend who worked here before me said that a resident said she was adopting the little boy because his dad was dead and his mother was terrible to him. The stories were all similar and creepy, but I still was skeptical. My first direct interaction with the boy was when a resident of ours broke his hip. We were changing him after he had a BM and he's in pain and he says fix this, fix that and it's just generally making complaints. I say okay sir, we'll get on it after we're done helping you. And he replies, can you do something about those damn kids? I freaked out because this man had never been told the stories and was a retired PhD holding professor and was far from the type to tell ghost stories. When I probed, he said that they'd come into his room at night, and they're loud and leave a mess. This, mind you, is the exact hole where all of the reported activity occurs. My next interaction was a couple of weeks later. I was sitting down that hall with my co-worker, and we had wheeled our resident to the window, down that hall to get some light. She was mostly non-verbal, but that day she spoke. She said, that poor baby. When I asked her to explain, she said, I'm going to take care of him. Your heart has to go out to him. His dad is dead and his mother doesn't want him. At this point, I should let you know that every time this kid was spotted, deaths started to happen. It wasn't always the people who saw the kid, but if someone saw him, I knew three people were about to pass away. If you've worked in this kind of facility, 
You know the death comes in threes saying is scarily accurate. I've come to the conclusion that I think this kid is actually death. Like literal grim reaper death. I think he shows up as a kid to not scare the residents. And I think his story is to make them trust him. I just got into work at 3 o'clock. It's 4.28 as I write this, and I had another interaction with him around 3.30. My favourite resident moved from one end of the building into the side with the ghost activity. She's sweet and a retired elementary teacher. She's never suffered from any kind of dementia or anything like that. I'm taking laundry down that hallway, and I hear her yell. I rush in, and she's standing without her walker. Something I didn't even know she could do. She was wobbly and yelling to get her the wheelchair. She said, that little boy was just standing there watching me fall and wouldn't hand me my chair. After she calmed down, I asked her to describe the boy. She said, he could have passed as either Anglo or Hispanic. He had beautiful skin but had dark circles around his eyes. His sister was with him and I heard his mother yelling for him to come back after you walked in. I was literally in the room with him. I'm mildly freaked out. I'm now just waiting to find out who's going to pass away. When I was younger, I'm talking from the ages of zero to six, my family and I lived in this house in Creston, Iowa. I'll never forget that place. It was two stories, the attic was technically three bedrooms, and mine was the one up the stairs. Go up the stairs through my brother's bedroom, hang a left through the parents' room, and to the back. Picture a bedroom with slanted walls and two windows in the back. That was my room. A bedroom, through a bedroom, to a bedroom. The layout of this place made zero sense. It also had a basement that from my very vague memory, never stopped flooding. Not sure what that has to do with the story, but I'd like to know what happened to this place. I remember a little road that if you followed it around the back, you'd go under this tunnel bridge that supported trains. If you'd look out the side window from the kitchen, you can see the public baseball fields. I'm 32 now and my brother is 29 and we still have dreams about this nightmare for children. Every night when I would go to sleep, I would see these glowing eyes in my windows. Two sets of them on occasion, like it brought its friggin' buddy to come peep on this five-year-old in the second story window. I would tell mom all the time. To this day, she thinks I made it up. She gave me the typical mom response and told me to stand up to my fears. I did. Once. That night I yelled, go away, and the body that the eyes were attached to started to frantically try to open the window. I had them locked, of course. Wouldn't go to bed without me locked. As soon as the growling and rattling started, I gunned it to my brother's room, and the little guy was floating out of his crib. I go to my mom's bed while having one of those throat-dry, can't-scream moments, trying to push her awake. My father comes walking up the stairs and my brother falls back in his crib. Dad hears him screaming and me standing there crying and reaching for him and he puts us both back to sleep. I didn't sleep. About a week went by that I didn't sleep and mom invited my grandparents to stay the night. My grandpa was apparently the only thing that could calm me. That old geezer made me feel safe, you know? On the third night of his stay, the eyes were back. So I went downstairs to snuggle up to my grandpa while he's asleep on the couch. When I rounded the corner, I could see something black floating up through his stomach and up through the ceiling. He's gasping for air and begging something above his head to make it stop. I was so freaked I froze. The next morning, I asked him about it. He said an angel was patting his head, telling him it was going to be okay. It's almost over. My brother was three and I was five. My grandparents are all past now. There's no way we should still be seeing this shit in our sleep by the time we're 30. I want to know if that place is still standing and if anything 
happened to anyone else who stayed there. I'd just like to know if it wasn't just us. A year ago, my girlfriend and I had just moved into this nice little studio apartment in Munich. The building had a twin right in front, separated by a garden about 15 meters wide. Our apartment's balcony looked down into this garden. On one end of the garden was a street through which a team went by, and on the other end was a third apartment building. At the corner of the building in front and the building to the side, there was a small entranceway from a second street and into the garden. So the street was small, had a sidewalk, and you could see only a little bit of it through the gap between the two buildings. I'll explain this in detail, since it will become important later on. A couple of nights after moving in, I was awoken at up around 3am by a sound that can only be described as a stack of metallic plates banging against one another, or as if someone had put a bunch of cutlery in a bag and shaked it in a very rhythmic fashion. I thought, that's odd, and went back to sleep. During the next couple of weeks, this kept happening almost every night, at the exact same hour. I noticed also that the sound seemed to cross the garden from one end to the other. It faded in, became intense, almost as if it was right in front of my apartment, and then faded out the other end. Eventually, my girlfriend heard it one night as she was getting some water and became scared shitless too. After some time, my curiosity became bigger than my patience. At this point, I was even waking up on my own around that hour, sometimes even a few seconds before the sound went by. One night, I get up, go into the balcony and wait. A minute later or so, I hear it. I look down into the garden, right as it's going by, and I see nothing. Now, I've never believed in the paranormal before. I'm your run-of-the-mill rational dude, but this got me baffled. I couldn't even come up with one single logical explanation. The sound seemed to come out of nowhere. I then jump over into the supernatural, and the only possible explanation I could come up with is that this had to be a ghost of some medieval knight or soldier or some shit. Full clad in armour and all. I mean, what the hell else could produce a sound like that? The next night, I wake up again and wait on the balcony, ready to see the best ghost story unfold before my eyes. Again, I see nothing. I decided to let it rest and just get used to it. But it kept happening until my patience was again gone. I go out onto the balcony another night, but this time I pay attention to the whole area as the sound is going by. Or the balconies, the roof of the buildings, and then I see it. Through the gap between the buildings in the corner of the garden, I see, for a split second, this dude in a black winter jacket pulling a small cart behind him. I smile to myself and think, son of a bitch, and go back to sleep like a baby. This happened when I was 18. Me and a workmate were working late. We worked at a restaurant called Valentine's. I was letting out the last customers before closing for the night. I thanked them and locked all the doors in the restaurant so we could start cleaning up. It was raining heavily and it was stormy weather, which isn't out of the ordinary for New Zealand, but it was crazy and creeped us workers out because the power and lights kept flicking on and off. Me and my mate were the last workers to finish up. My mate, being the manager, had told everyone to finish up since we didn't have a lot to do, but asked if one of us could stay. I offered to stay. We were having a good old laugh and chat, and I would say we'd been cleaning for about an hour, until we heard a massive bang in the reception area. It sounded like the door. A guy came running in, asking if he could use the bathroom, and he looked desperate, soaked to the bone and sad looking like he'd been crying. So me and my mate said, okay, sure. I thought to myself, I'm sure I locked the door. Maybe the crazy wind blew it open. I went and shut the door, but didn't lock it. So the guy who ran in could get out. Me and my mate decided to have a break. So we sat down, started eating and talked for a good 30 minutes. 
and then we both noticed that the guy that wanted to use the bathroom hadn't come out yet. My mate went to check on him and said he wasn't in the toilet. So we kind of assumed he ducked out without us knowing. So I went back to the door, left unlocked, and locked it. Within those few minutes I was walking back to the table to finish my meal, the door smashed open again and the same guy came in asking the same thing. I was kind of creeped out. I turned to my mate who was freaked out more than I was and my friend was signalling me to look into the tinted windows that were in front of me. The lights started flickering, on and off again, which made it hard for me to figure out what my friend was trying to signal me to do. I looked behind me and the guy was still standing there. I turned and looked in the window and noticed the person had no reflection. My heart was racing and I kept my eyes on my friend. We both said he could use the toilet. My friend is psychic or has some gift. Said the third time around isn't a good sign. So he told me to leave everything and we locked the restaurant immediately. Nothing ever happened after that, but it was creepy. It's probably the only intense experience I've had. Later on, we discovered that the theme park that it's built across the road from, the restaurants also experienced things as well. They've had more bad ones where workers would end up sick. Some say it's because it's built on an old cemetery. I'm 30 right now, and I still remember it as if it happened yesterday. When I was younger, my mum unknowingly gave me her old Ouija board. The one she used when she was a kid, so around some time in the 80s. I started playing around with it when I was probably 11 or 12. Anyways, I'd always been fascinated with ghosts and spirits. Anything to do with the paranormal. Although, I didn't really know much about Ouija boards then. I also didn't know how to properly use one. So long story short, I think as a kid I might have let lots of spirits through or something. Because since then, I've had lots of unexplainable experience. There's always one that comes to mind. It was around the time I was about to move. Because for some reason, that increased the activity. Anyways, my mum was out to get teriyaki for dinner, and I was watching television in the living room. It was around 6pm in the evening. I was laying on the couch, watching my favourite cartoon, when I got this feeling of panic. I felt as if something was watching me. I even heard the floor creaking like there was someone in the bathroom hallway. I remember turning down the TV and looking over at the other couch, where my two dogs were momentarily sleeping, their ears slightly shifting around. I heard what I thought sounded like the closet doors slowly open, and all of a sudden, I heard a loud thump. My dogs woke up and frantically jumped off the couch and started barking. They started running from the front door like someone was there. I quickly sat up and turned around. I was expecting to be met with something or someone and all I see is my Ouija board laying right beside the rug in the walkway of the living room which was about 12 to 15 feet away from the closet by the bathroom. I remember picking up the board shortly after and putting it back in the closet. Overall, it was pretty fucking scary and left me visibly shaken to my mother. After that experience which I believe was in 2015 or 16, I learned how to properly use a Ouija board. It was the summer of 2015. I was about to move out of the city and into the mountains with my mom. It was late at night and I was getting ready for bed. The condo we lived in would make me feel very unsafe at night. Specifically, the downstairs, which is where the two bedrooms were. I'd almost always have these vivid night terrors. In my night terrors, I'd be visited by a shadow man, dressed in all black, who would slowly chase me around the woods of my house, and he'd eventually kill me in these very unpleasant and painful ways. He would almost always come out of the small room behind the washer and dryer in the hallway. The room scared me shitless. It was a small, dark cement room under the stairs. I had no idea what it was there for or why. It was sad we were moving, but I was glad to be getting the fuck out. I decided to sleep on the couch on my last night in my old house. 
mainly because my bed was already in a moving truck. I remember putting my pyjamas on and heading upstairs with the worst feeling that someone was right behind me. I ran up the stairs. I flopped onto the couch and wrapped the semi-see-through sheet over my body. It almost felt like my heart was about to beat out of my chest. I was petrified. I heard soft and slow footsteps make their way to me. I remember crying and trying to convince myself it was my dog. Shortly after, I saw a hand print push into the sheet cocoon I had wrapped myself in. I remember telling it to go away and closing my eyes and continuing to cry until I passed out. Still to this day, weird things happen in my home. I've seen the same shadow apparition of a tall man, about six foot seven, in what looks to be a western style hat, with what kind of looks like a duster. He'd stand or walk outside my room in the hallway and whistle eerily and off key. I've even once had two friends who I was FaceTiming hear the apparition slash shadow man walking around my hallway whistling. Sometimes he would even mess with my electricity or electronics. Hell, I had two perfectly working iPhones suddenly start acting crazy and eventually end up breaking. One of which I had a 15 second video where I caught the whistling outside my window. I even remember frantically sending it to one of my friends who I had previously told about the haunting slash weird experiences. Sometimes I'd also hear scratching in my walls, yet there's no room for anyone. There's no rodents either. Recently I've gotten wicker, so I've been burning protective herbs, incense and such. Thankfully, the activity has since significantly died down. But every so often, I still hear whistling in the woods, in my front yard or right outside my window. Even my mom and my animals hear it. I'm not quite sure what this is. A spirit? A demon? If I'm being completely transparent, I got into the occult when I was young, around 12 to be specific. But I didn't know what I was really getting into. Perhaps that could have been the cause? I'm still not sure. A couple of years ago, I had my first paranormal encounter and the only one I remember that I'm not that skeptical about. Again, I don't remember the exact details because I was very young at the time. All I remember is me going out of my room in the middle of the night or in the very early morning. It was very dark, so it's one of the two and standing in our hallway. I live in a three story building, counting the basement and all our rooms, my parents and brother's rooms are upstairs. So we have this little space-like hallway in the middle of our doors to our rooms. So no matter what room you're in, you can open the doors and look down the stairs. I was standing in that hallway-like space and I looked down the stairs and I saw what I remember looking like my dad at the top of the stairs. The position he was in was a crawling-like position and I only remember seeing the top of his torso and his head, of course. Now the weird thing about it was that he was glowing white. He was white like a piece of paper and the lines on his body that made out the nose, eyes and hair was a blue like colour. I just stared at him and he stared back. Nobody said anything, not even me. I just stared. I think I stared for 15 to 20 seconds before going on with my business. I don't remember what I was doing. Maybe I was going to the toilet or waking up my brother, I don't remember. But I do remember checking the stairs while going back and he was gone. I told it to my parents the next day but my dad told me he didn't leave the bed that night. I swear I've been a paranormal magnet since I exited the womb. Let me tell you. I have an entire note section in my phone of experiences that I can remember and because I have so many it's difficult to really scare me anymore. But part of this story freaks me out a lot. It started in 2017. The activity in the house started to pick up more than usual that year. So seeing and hearing things just became a part of my day and I never thought twice about any of it. One night in September, I went to bed early because I felt sick and had plans the next day. Now I'm not someone who was blessed with the ability to fall asleep instantly. 
So after about 20 minutes of laying with my eyes closed, I felt the corner of my bed dip down. I felt the dip move along the edge of my bed, up to my utter back where it stopped for a second. Then it went back to the door. I was a teenager with a horrendously messy room, so I just thought it was one of my parents coming in to get something I borrowed. And they were using the bed to not trip over anything. I turned my focus back to sleeping and felt the movement again. Still convinced it was a parent struggling to find something, I laid there. But after the third time, I realised. I never heard my door open. I immediately sat up to find myself alone in my room, with the door obviously still closed. I was freaked out but felt like shit, so I laid back down and tried to ignore it when it started moving again. Eventually, I finally fell asleep. For the next year or so, at least once a week, I would feel something jump onto the end of my bed and walk around a little before laying across my legs. I could even feel the heartbeat of whatever it was. It would only happen while I was trying to fall asleep, but later it started walking around even if I was wide awake. It would only stop if I turned to look at it. With the earlier behaviour and my mom telling me she once heard scratching from the inside of my door at 6am one morning, we assumed it was a dog. My childhood dog passed away long ago, so I didn't know who it could be. But it became an almost nightly routine that I soon found comfort in. However, one night, I woke up to the feeling of a full human laying next to me. The whole side of my bed was dipped down as if someone was there. My bed is only a twin bed, so trust me, you feel anything and everything. But I wasn't scared at all, and just went back to sleep. A year later, we moved to a new house. And this is where my comfort of a ghost dog was replaced with confusion. It became a nightly thing. What used to be a bit of walking, then laying down and sleeping with me, turned into constant moving. It was no longer the feeling of a larger dog laying across my calves. It was the feeling of my entire legs and lower back being pushed into the bed. Some nights I feel the one dog walking, but more often than not, I now feel multiple smaller things walking around at the same time. Or I feel a... Let's say human for the sake of my sanity. Just imagine someone standing at the end of your bed, putting their hands on either side of your body and climbing onto the bed on top of you. Yeah, I don't know what the fuck that's about, but okay. My mom told me I should try recording it one night to see if I could see the bed moving. Since I'm the only one who experiences this. So about a year and a half ago, while I was watching YouTube on my iPad before bed, I felt it come up. I was laying on my stomach. Without turning around, I grabbed my phone next to me and it was still walking. As soon as I opened the camera, it stopped. So I waited again, and when I felt it, I hit record and pointed the camera at the end of my bed. It walked for a little bit and stopped again. So I tried to watch the video, but I had so many blankets you couldn't see anything. I was going to try again, but it stopped for the night. I didn't sleep for three days starting that night. I was waking up every 45 minutes, panicked. And I mean like heavy breathing, almost crying panicked. I feared falling asleep. Every time I woke up, I would turn on my flashlight and stare at my closet. Yeah, closets are creepy, but I was terrified of it and had no idea why. So the next two nights I stayed up as late as I could. So the little bit of sleep I did get would be during the lighter hours of the early morning. The fourth night I was completely fine. Slept perfectly fine and had no worries about the closet. I was alone in my bed those three nights. I've slept with the lights on almost every night since then. Aside from the dog turning into a human and the multiple smaller things, this was what really made me think, okay, so maybe the dog consumption was correct. Two weeks later, I woke up in the middle of the night. When I was a kid, I had a weird thing where at least once every couple weeks, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, hallucinate bugs everywhere around me, and throw myself out of bed. This was my first time doing it again in years. That morning, I woke up with a giant bruise on my inner leg. I know I didn't hit anything that night, because there was literally nothing for me to hit besides the door. This bruise was immediately bright purple and blue. 
hurt so bad to even lightly touch and took a good two plus weeks to go away. Like there's no way I wouldn't have felt it. Sometime after that, I can't remember exactly when, I was trying to sleep and whatever it was would not sit still and I was getting annoyed. So I said something like, yeah, all right, buddy, I'm gonna need you to sit down or fuck off. I wanna sleep. And it stopped for a second. Then there was a loud growl directly into my ear. For some reason I wasn't scared. So I just laughed at it and went to sleep. Other than the aggressive nightly walking around my bed, the most recent thing was a couple months ago where I was sleeping, but I woke up and couldn't open my eyes or move. I felt like whatever it was in its human form pinning me down. After a few seconds of trying to violently move my body, I finally moved and could open my eyes. So that was fun. I have so many other stories, but they're all just like, haha, today this happened. Well, this is an ongoing, more interesting thing, I guess. But maybe I'll share more in the future.